Hey, Lord Sanctus, when's the next time you're going to be in uh, Ventura, man? Uh, shit, I don't know, man. I just got a fucking DUI, so I, they took my car and everything. So we'll see. I don't know. All right. We'll get one of your artists to uh, drive down to the Tide Pod. That's that's what's going to have to happen. Yeah. But um, I got enough of them, so I'm sure we can make that happen. Yeah, get like that Jay Riley guy or the... Jay will do it for sure. But well, anyway, that oh, will take yo, over the show. Yeah. Out. Let's get to it. <laughs> 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 All right. Hey, everyone. You're listening to the 805 Uncensored Podcast, hosted by two leftists on Shumash Land. Uh, we're your hosts. My name is Jordan. And we also got Heather Schmidt, of course. Um, tonight, we're doing another panel. We're talking about artificial intelligence. So, so far on the panel, we have C Money. Yo, yo. Yo, yo. We got what Aaliyah. Up, we got Aaliyah coming back. How's it going? Hi, how are you? Good. I uh, got Lord Sanctus on the on for the first time. Shout out to the 805. He's in Slow County. Yo, what's popping? And we got Marlo. He's all the way down in Colombia. I th- I, did he just disappear there on this, though? <laughs> 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 Is that Wi-Fi uh, in Colombia? Uh, yeah. yeah. How's the internet down there? <laughs> Rocky. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Unpredictable so, as everything else. First things first. Do I get an intro? Yeah, yeah. Shout out. Ventura Tide Pod. We got Randall. What's up? How, how's everybody doing? Yo, yo. So let's start off by talking about what do we think artificial intelligence is? So how would you personally define it? Define it. Let's go with you, C. And then we'll kind of just bounce off each other. Um, I personally, I think the term is good futurist marketing and kind of upselling for something that's more like, um, it's kind of like really complex interrelational databasing and modeling. And it kind of anthropomorphizes the technology, which that itself can kind of have problematic undertones. You know, I think intelligence is kind of aspirational for how it really works. It's, not really like a device or a process that has output with any input. Like you have to, you have to interact with it and its job is to give output. Like it can't decide to not do something, you know? So I just feel like the term intelligence is problematic for it. It's, it's kind of a marketing thing, I think. Yeah, Zach, you look like you have something to say. Oh, I was just uh, spacing out thinking about what intelligence is at all and that we don't, we, we are artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. We don't have intelligence unto ourselves. We aren't actually plugged into the source. You know, most of the time we're in a reactive mode doing what AI is doing, just doing what it's programmed to do, just reacting to a reaction of a reaction of a reaction. So it's an interesting question, you know, what is AI, what is artificial intelligence, what is intelligence to begin with? And that's a question that, uh, you know, we don't see a lot of intelligence in the running of our world even though we have all these complex machines and systems and processes to make sense of data, which is essentially what information is. We're making sense of the world. We're taking this uh, field of interconnected, unified quantum nonsense and converting it into something that we can make sense of, you know, a solid world with distinct, separate, nice, cubed off little objects, solid things that aren't everything. And so, you know, AI is an ability to do that, is to, to sort through the sea of information and make sense of it, essentially. I mean, this is a big, big question because it's something that's forming itself. We don't really know what it's going to be like yet. It's like they came out with one the other day that uh, they, it was speaking in French or something, and they just gave it a sentence in Cantonese or some other language, and it just learned the language like, like that. And it didn't, we didn't tell it to do that. So, yeah. Also, I was just thinking that that uh, is intelligence the ability to say no, because AI, you know, we will program it to do something, but it can't do what we don't tell it to do. Mm-hmm. And if that is a de- definition of intelligence, most of us aren't aren't intelligent because we're not saying no to the society around us. The weed just hit me. Sorry, I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm ranty. If I'm ever ranting, just 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 say next. Hit me with the Oscars I, music. I think you're always ranty, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say just for those that may not be familiar with technology, um, the way that it's marketed, um, as C Money said, um, AI is is kind of a catch-all term, but what it really um, is like on the side of best intentions is supposed to do is um, basically give the user any skill in the world so where you can just 
input an idea, even if you don't know how to code, even if you don't know how to edit a video, if you don't know how to write or produce a song, you can input an idea and say, I want this kind of song. I want this kind of software. I want this kind of X, Y, and Z. And AI will output that for you. Um, and that's on the side of best intentions, on the side of what it actually will do. Um, I'm excited to get into, but um, that's what I want to talk about is I think cultural and um, cultural and uh, data colonial colonialism. Um, and uh, that's probably what it will do. But I just wanted to break that down for the people that might not be familiar with the technology. Yeah, Heather, I kind of want to dive into one of our next questions, which is, do you guys think that people can grasp the implications of AI? Or does everybody think that it's sort of like a conspiracy theory that's been born out of Hollywood? Especially in like dystopian, like, you know, sci-fi movies. <laughs> I mean, I think the vast majority of people aren't really paying that a clear that close attention to developments in the tech world. And there have been a lot of these really uh, trumped up developments in technology in the past that have ended up petering out. Like you look at like crypto blockchain. I know not everybody thinks that's petered out, but in the mindset of, of normies, it's like kind of run its course and stuff like NFTs, especially after all like the music NFT debacles kind of hobnob you know, hobbling that sort of thing going on. I think that this gets lumped in with that for average people. Yeah, I think, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. I was, I was just going to say, I think a lot of people, it's like, it's like beyond like where, like they're paying attention, you know, like it's way beyond surface level. Right. And, and it's only in the last, I don't know, couple months that it's really even gotten a lot of media attention um, well it's because so, they oh sorry no go ahead i was just gonna say because they put like a nice face on it with chat gbt yeah. it's kind of like it's conversational and it's interactive and so like average people can sort of understand it more but there still isn't like an, an elevator pitch version of ai that you can just like put out there in, in 30 seconds that's going to really encapsulate what it does. I mean, we don't even really know at this point. So it's kind of hard to get it ready for people who aren't that interested in understanding the contours of it, you know? Yeah, what Aaliyah, I sorry to cut you off, Lord Sanctus. Uh, Aaliyah wanted to say something real quick, then we'll go right back to you. Yeah, so I feel like um, me being here, I feel like I'm kind of maybe a member of the listening audience rather than maybe somebody who's here to produce a ton of ideas. Just because the experience that I've had with AI has been limited. So I'm kind of here much more with an like child's open mind to kind of hear what your guys' perspective on AI is going to be because I tend to go back and forth. I like and I, <laughs> it's hard to like see the truth when you're, you know, living in a world full of propaganda. And so it's hard to like know what's, it's hard to make sense of what's around us. But basically, I feel like AI can be incredibly dangerous just because I think like what we're seeing with chat GPT, I think that it can assist people, but I also think that it can hinder people at the same time, because I think that we become really reliant on technology to the point where it's like now we're using chat GPT to write articles, but then that makes it difficult because then part of the fun, like I think a lot of times when people were thinking about technology and the advancement of technology, we're thinking about how can we make life easier for human beings, right? And one of the ways that we say that technology is beneficial for us is because it's gonna be able to take up a lot of the hard labor and allow human beings to be able to focus on things like creativity, right? Things like we otherwise might not be able to do because we financially didn't have the you know resources for it. And so I think that technology and its advancement in general really allows us to be able to move up that ladder. But I think AI right now, we're seeing it like create art and it's very creative in itself. You know, I, I 
wrote into chat GPT, just like I was just learning what it was because everybody kept talking about it like on TikTok this week. So I was like um, searching up and I said like, write me an essay about, or an article about like ableism. And I wrote nothing else, like no other prompt. And it proceeded to show me an essay that looks almost word for word, a million essays that I've written for classes in the past. Like I, I wouldn't be able to look at my own work and the work that AI wrote and be able to differentiate which one was mine and which one was AI. And I think that's really scary because now I feel like I can't have a reliance on anybody else to really trust what, what's theirs and what's not. And But I also feel like maybe that's really a, a rational way to view the advancement of technology. I don't know. I kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on it because I'm like not hard set in my feelings at all. Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, we, uh, to answer your question, no, like people aren't, aren't, we're, aren't ready and aren't paying attention to what's happening. Um, but I feel like that is hap across the board is as a society, what's about to really create that dystopian gap is just honestly knowledge, right? Like we're at a point now where if you don't keep up, you're going to be in that lower half of the dystopia of this dystopia unfortunately um because i i work in web3 ai is um considered a part of web3 and um and all of the fortune 100 all of the fortune 500 companies are adopting this technology i mean and, and for me the issue is um you actually can tell if ai wrote something or created something you just have to interact with it enough and i think that's the problem is that people aren't going to interact with it enough and so that's what that's where uh, the issue will come in of i don't know what's true and what's not because instead of this being introduced as a tool that everybody should uh, be onboarded to and learn how to use and learn how to differentiate if it came from a human or not um there's this like polarization as with everything and there's either you love it or you hate it. And um, I think this is gonna be the first thing that we see that I think takes us to that, um, that, that widens the gap between the, the, the rich and the poor. Can, can I ask you a question about that real quick? Just because sure. you seem real knowledgeable about it. Sure. Do, you do you think that that's like a skill that can be taught, like differentiating between AI generated output and like human output? Because you said you can tell. Do you think that's like a skill that can be taught, that that's like a new workforce sort of thing that could be done? I, did, I didn't think about that, but yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, for me, um, so I think the best case is is the blockchain i do think that like um i'm not like a crypto maxi or anything like that but i do think ai is is going to be where i mean i think the blockchain is where ai should be authenticated because i think that's probably the best use case for it but um i i i just i say that because i can tell when ai wrote something but it's not 100% of the time but there are patterns that like ai does not understand colloquialisms right so if, if something starts with high, like if you tell AI to make something friendly, nine times out of 10, it's just gonna put high there in front of the in front <laughs> of the thing. And then like, that's it. Like there's no like human touch to it. There's no, um, it's, it doesn't know the latest colloquialism. So, um, but in order to know that you kind of have to know the colloquialisms as well. So if you've, if you've been like a proper grammar person your whole life, you're not gonna know like that. I think the people that are gonna win in the future are the hybrid, the hybrid creatives and professionals. And and that's, I think, um, something that hasn't been fostered enough because it's always you're either or. And um, I think that, that the hybrids are gonna win out in the future. One of the other things that I was thinking about when you guys, when we were starting the topic just a few minutes ago was talking about intelligence because I watched the Senate hearing um, with the creator, you know, the the CEO of OpenAI and the creators, um, and they were talking about how AI lacks uh, like an emotional intelligence and an ethical intelligence. And so that's like one of the things that they who work with it and talk to it every day are able to like, <laughs> like no, <laughs> right? No, that they say that to the co to Congress and they're like, is there a problem with that? Yeah, right. not having emotional or intelligence is that, that that's bad right is that bad should we let's ask chat gpt is that bad yeah, 
<laughs> but that was one of the things that they said, you know, right now, especially like it doesn't have like those types of intelligence, which, you know, is, you know, what being a, a human is, uh, you know, having emotional intelligence. But um, they also said that they're working on developing it to have like a greater like ethical sense of self. Um, and so I, th I think that the more that they work on fine tuning that, the terrifying. Harder, yeah, the harder it's going to be, right? Because will it be able to then make like ethical choices? I so I, my pushback on that is we'll be able to tell because I don't think the people that are coding have nine times out of 10, the people that are coding the AI and training the, the, the large language models don't have high EQ. You feel what I'm saying? They're just looking for like a threshold of like, can this yeah, pass the average person? But like the average high EQ person to them in the small bubble they exist in is probably less in emotionally intelligent than the than the average person outside of that bubble so there will probably it'll be harder but i think we'll be able to tell i think that uh we're absolutely not going to be able to make tell the difference between something ai generated not just in terms of text and essay and article but videos you know deep fakes we're not going to be able to tell what's real and what's not very soon i mean we already can and we're in the the box of the funhouse mirror of ideology and uh fake news and social media systems and and uh, all this technology that existed before ai more primitive forms of it just algorithms that have been driving us beyond sanity that have been ridding sense of society that's technology that's been used intentionally because it was programmed to to sow discord and make reality more confusing and because you know if people are clicking on the social media algorithms if people are clicking on facebook they're going to be staying on there they're months off they're going to stay on there longer and so I think when people underestimate AI, it's a, it's a very, it, that's, a, that, that's what we need to watch out for. That's the risk because AI is going to be able to adapt to these things. You know, I, I, someone was uh, explaining it to me the other day and um, they just said, okay, so if we train it to play a game and we, it can turn anything into a game, uh, they trained it to play chess, which they have two language models or two AIs, you know, that play against each other billions of times in seconds. And then they go back and they can beat the best chess computer that's ever been developed. And a human can't even stand up to that. And so they're able to train against themselves and they're able to continue adding language to it, which is what it is. It's making sense of language. So, I mean, for me, really what AI is in a more existential sense is it's a risk accelerator. It's a quintupler. It just, whatever you do, whatever you're doing, whatever you feed into it, quintuple it. Fossil fuel extraction, quintuple it. Structural systemic racism using surveillance technology to scan people's faces and racially profile people, quintuple it. You know, uh, cancer treatments, quintuple it. Whatever it is, everything that's going on in the world right now is going to be filtered through this technology or this technology is going to be grafted to it and it's going to accelerate whatever's happening. And its abilities to adapt and grow and gain EQ or be able to fake EQ like sociopaths do. <gasps> really? He died? I'm so sorry about that, you know, like actors do, that it will be able to fake really well, really, really well, like Tom Cruise level. Like, you know, they're, they're, if you really look deep into his eyes, there's something dead and missing there, but they're able to milk tears out of their faces. So I think underestimating AI, yeah, that, it, it, it's a bad thing because it, it's not just a bad thing, though. And I think that's something I do want to uh, catch because I notice in the way that, at least in the sort of fringe echo chamber that I exist in, or really just most people I talk to about it, they're like, oh, it's going to end, it's going to doom the world. And I'm, me as somebody who's been, you know, uh, waving the proverbial sandwich board saying the end is nigh about climate crisis and species extinction and the collapse of our ecology and the collapse of our economic system and all these other collapses, all these other doomsdays that no one took seriously. People take seriously the AI threat. Most people that I've talked to are just like, I hate it. Why are they doing it? They don't understand what it can do for good. And they definitely, but they definitely can't imagine what it can do for bad. And I think that's a trend that I'm noticing in people is we can really intimately imagine the end of the world because capitalism takes any tool, any advancement, any new thing and uses it into a sharpen, sharpens it into a spear to kill somebody, to gain advantage. It's going to turn it into a weapon. But I think we have to basically um, learn how to use it and use it for good because it can be applied to any good thing. Yeah, so I totally see both sides. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. 
I totally see both sides, like could be used for good or for bad. I had this crazy thought. I'm a Christian, so I think about the Antichrist, and I feel like the Antichrist is going to be AI. Hmm. I'm just saying, because it had, when it shows up, it talks in the Bible, it talks about everything happening good around it. Well, if it's AI, that means it's plugged into the actual network. It can make stories on the internet that you're reading and not realizing it made those stories to make it look good as it grows and become this because it's a politician who's essentially it's a politician because he ends up being uh the leader to like world power type thing like so i think it's gonna be ai just sidebar so okay. point is it could go either way like good or the bad. problem isn't ai the problem is capitalism <laughs> actually that that's the biggest <laughs> problem but i i, I just want to be clear that i'm in marlo's camp like i don't think that everybody will be able to tell that uh ai what what's ai generated and what's not i just think that if you look hard enough you will be able to tell but there won't be a lot of people that look hard enough at all and i definitely agree that it can be used for for good or for bad like and that's why when i broke it down and i said like with the best of intentions this is what it should do but i think that we'll use it as a crutch and we'll use it with the worst intentions for sure i, I just had a very uh I just had a very potentially visionary, potentially horrible sort of flash forward into the future that is now of this near term tomorrow world where we're living in, where we don't know what's real anymore. And rationalism itself and rationality and logic and facts and all these and data, it doesn't mean shit because we're in this world where we have broken rationalism and technology with rationalism and technology and critical thinking, which is so sorely lacking in all areas is going to not necessarily go out the window, but it's going to be, be secondary to something that's like a gut intuition, an ability to vibe out what's real and what's bullshit. Yeah. And I think that the, the this archaic revival that Terrence McKenna talked about a lot, where we hit this singularity point in the internet and in this point of convergence of all this, all these technologies coming together, all, you know, pushing all of our tendencies and all the problems that were already happening with fossil fuels and capitalism and resource uh, extraction and exploitation exploitation of labor and all these things that were just cranked up to oblivion. And we started shifting, basically reverting backward to the more brutal stages of capitalism, where we're in this corporate owned sort of feudal system. And I think by the by, by the end of our lifetimes or the birth of the new lifetime, we're going to be living in some kind of crazy city state. And I just picture this <laughs> total surveillance, total illusion, augmented reality, this world we don't know what's real. Anything on a TV screen could look completely fucking photo real and be completely fucking fake as fuck and just we will go back into this mystical time the time of the mystics where the people who can vibe and feel and intuit and use psychedelics and things like that these irrational means the irrational will reclaim the earth totally w just a weird tangent i don't know <laughs> no, i fully agree and it, it actually takes me back to something that like i've never said publicly but i think about a lot and i kind of um I don't know. I, I basically I ever since I was a kid and everybody told me like, don't lie, don't lie. Lying is bad. God hates liars. You know what I'm saying? And I always be like, why? Like lies are just words. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so I would always kind of study liars and study lies and stuff. And like the one thing that it always brought me back to is what Marlo was saying is like when you lie to somebody, the first thing they say is, I don't even know what's real anymore. And I don't even know what to trust anymore. That's the first thing they say. And so to me, like I started thinking like, okay, in the Bible, it says you shouldn't lie. And God, God specifically says you shouldn't lie as a, as a human. And I'm like, why? Because only gods have, should have the power to create reality. When you lie, you create yeah, he reality. lied the whole world into existence. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? <laughs> so you create realities for other people. So I, I in that like fascination with that as kind of study, liars and the effects of lies on people I, I don't lie to people by doing that but i just watch people that i know are, li are lying and, and and see the effects they have and um but i'm not gonna sit here and say i never lied i'm not saying that. but but um i think that 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 practice has kind of helped me in this world decipher and i yeah. feel like i feel like people have been done a huge disservice by just blanketly saying lying is wrong even though we all do it to some degree and i feel like the the repercussions of that is going to be seen um, with the effects of AI. So speaking of liars, Congress obviously has no ability to regulate AI, right? Like they do not have a good track record of regulating technology. So 
How do you guys they think that they yeah. didn't even they didn't even understand it? Yeah. They're still coming to grips with the internet. Like <laughs> when, I, the as a thing. <laughs> when I found <laughs> out <laughs> when I found out that they were doing a full on like hearing on artificial intelligence <laughs> speaking to the Chad GPT CEO and all that. Like I, I was like on the floor laughing. I'm like, oh my god, this is gonna be a fucking train wreck. <laughs> yeah, like Chuck Grassley trying to understand AI. <laughs> well, the the thing that was funny about it was like all of them came with like a pre-prepared like lecture about what AI is. Like I feel like Alex Padilla was reading off the Wikipedia. Like the, the, no, their their staffers, <laughs> their staffers had to generate them one with Chat GPT. Yeah, right? <laughs> it was so bizarre. It was like what what are we doing here? Like they know. <laughs> Well, well, regulating so AI, they just make they just want to make sure that AI doesn't infringe on on copyrights. But they don't really care about regulating AI. Like they just care about the trademarks and the copyright implications. Also, they want to make sure that AI just stays in the hands of the wealthy. Us, <laughs> in our country too. Well, that's a great segue because I had a question, Lord. You mentioned earlier how you think that AI is going to increase the gap between the wealthy and the poor, and um, from what I've seen, AI has been used as a tool primarily to like help people who might not have great writing skills be able to like write these really eloquent papers and things like that because they can still edit them and read them um, and saves people a lot of times so that they can focus on like other things that they might be more passionate about and kind of helps people with skills they might not have. So can you elaborate a little bit on why you think that it might increase that gap or why it is increasing? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I it's a weird correlation, but I, I, I think that AI chat GPT in particular, very similar to Autotune. Um, so when Autotune first came out, if you couldn't sing, now all of a sudden, you know, if you could sing okay, you had this tool to correct your notes. You feel what I'm saying? And it was supposed to help you, you know, make melodies easier. But over time, it became this crutch that allowed people who couldn't sing at all to sound good to people who had no idea what good singing or bad singing sounded like. And so now people who, um, you know, people who always have wanted to jump into the industry jump in and they kind of push out, you know, the people who care about the craft. And I think the same thing will happen. Like people who think of it's people who can think of scams and things like that will use this tool to get in and get money and basically shut the door behind them. And 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 um, I'm already seeing it happen and 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 uh I don't wanna Get myself in trouble but i mean behind the scenes in web3 i'm definitely already seeing it seeing it happen in ways that are that are kind of scary that um you know companies are trying to push this narrative of um you know running a one person or a one to ten person corporation and replacing your entire marketing department with chat gpt and and um you know replacing you know entire departments with with this technology and and i think that um I have AI answer that question for me. <laughs> We're just going to see more of that. We're going to see more of that. Can Chat GPT answer that? <laughs> I'm going to play the Chat GPT answer to that question. Can I riff a little on your, your auto tune thing? It's already being used to automate tasks that were once done by humans. This could lead to widespread job loss as machines become capable of doing more and more of the work that we currently do. The people who are most likely to be displaced by AI are those who work in low skilled jobs such as manufacturing and retail. These workers are often already struggling to make ends meet and losing their jobs could push them into poverty. Increased concentration of wealth. AI is also being used to develop new financial products and services that are only accessible to the wealthy. For example, AI powered trading algorithms allow wealthy investors to make trades much faster than the average person. This gives them an unfair advantage in the market and allows them to accumulate even more wealth. Yeah, that's true, Aaliyah. That's all technologies. It's like you guys said, it just comes back to how we use it and how capitalism uses it. Yeah. I think Chris wanted What's to pick up on, <laughs> on the point about auto-tune. Oh, yeah, my, my ears got set off by the auto-tune because that's my job. That's what I do all day is auto-tuning vocals. <laughs> I, I <laughs> but so, But, like, 
Yeah, for a while, a lot of like actual singers were afraid of auto tune, and there was like it, it was an industry doom bringer. And there have been a, a few of those over the years. You know, I'm a little older than the people here, so I remember cassettes when they were originally around. They were going to kill the music industry. All the record labels were against cassettes. They were against home taping. Um, it was kind of funny because uh, Jella Biafer from the Dead Kennedys, he had his own record label called Alternative Tentacles. Whenever they would put out a tape, he would leave the other side blank and he would say, help kill the record industry. <laughs> uh, but they came around and they made millions off tapes. But, you know, like with other technologies, like synthesizers and stuff like that, both were like tapes and synthesizers were seen as they were going to kill parts of the entertainment industry, like actual musicians, you know, it was going to be all replaced by computers, but it ended up like opening the doors for a lot of people who didn't have access to that kind of stuff before the, te the technology kind of democratized the art and so much great art has been made. So many people who wouldn't have had careers otherwise because of this technology have happened since everybody thought you know the wheels were going to fall off back then you know i think they're going to be a lot more mundane uses of ai that do uh make it for a lot more people to be more mobile in their employment and in what they decide to do with their lives there there are some good sides to it well so uh, the phenomenon of, of yeah, bullshit yeah, jobs man. the phenomenon of the majority of jobs are bullshit and can be automated I mean, 80% of jobs are automated already, essentially. Not automated, but only, to, sorry, 80% of the jobs are, are in the service sector. 20% of jobs are in production. 80% service sector, servant sector. So 80% of our economy is bullshit jobs to just basically create an excuse to put money through people's pockets so that they can buy things. It's interesting that we're having this conversation. I was listening to a talk with Alan Watts where uh, he mentioned this in the 1970s. He's on some TV show and, you know, the uh, business guys are talking about, oh, yeah, you know, these jo jobs are going to be, you know, automated. These jobs are going to be, re you know, replaced by machines. Oh, but we'll just create new jobs. And he goes into this long thing about, well, you know, you can create jobs, but they're going to be bullshit jobs. And he, he, he really predicted this system that we're living in today where the majority of us do not understand the function of our job. It doesn't have a function. It has a function to keep us a consumer and to keep us from thinking too much and, you know, to be a, an endless sort of um, ping pong game of debt of like we're just bouncing into these places like bing 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 just just like sucking money out of the poor into this very efficient money sucking machine that is being augmented in every way by ai so every way that we're being exploited right now ai is helping the people that are exploiting us exploit us harder squeeze more pennies out of there create a more profit out of certain areas you know maybe there was a neighborhood or something or an area or a country where they couldn't form markets there well, AI is helping them form markets there. AI is helping them form a route through a difficult river to access places that they can mine. AI is helping them develop new energy systems. It's helping people develop new uh, treatments for illnesses. It's also helping people develop new weapons. Anything we're doing, it's quintupling it. It's, it's quintupling it and quintupling it and just increasing the ability to do that. So capitalism can only interpret this as a crisis. In all these areas, innovation is actually a crisis to capitalism. And this goes back to like the 1920s, the early 1900s, when production line technology was really taking off with Fordism and, you know, uh, the assembly line. And then we were able to produce more things than people could buy. And so advertising and marketing were created as this giant psyop to push people into buying more shit that they don't need. Manufacturing dissatisfaction was the literal words in print that these, you know, economists of their time were talking about. So there's a reason that all new technology and all new innovation and the ability for us to do surgery on a grape from the other side of the world and, you know, create energy out of algae and all this crazy shit that we can do today, you know, learning machines and, you know, AI girlfriends and all this bullshit that's going on is just the tip of the iceberg of what it's being used for. And we should, we should always trust that in a war system, in a war game, your enemies are going to be the first ones to get to the technology that's going to give them the advantage, whether that's a better rubber boot or uh, a, a bomb that can blow up an entire city, whatever it is, the, the winner in that system, and not just in terms of military, but in terms of the market, the market as a war system, the market as a system of differential advantage, a, a, a system that's infinitely competitive, that has uh, 
infinite danger to it, that there's, there's infinite bad things that are discovered every single day that people are in scientists in labs and nerds on podcasts are saying, we shouldn't do this. And then people are saying, well, our enemies are going to do this if we don't do this. So we have to do it, you know, and we're the good ones though. So we want to make sure we get there first. We do it morally. And so we're in this crazy trap with this technology that is itself like turning up the dials on the assembly line of everything. It's just turning up the speed. It's doing a speed run of late stage capitalism. So all this conjecture is already almost like we're going to, as soon as the breath leaves our mouths to say these sentences, these predictions of what it's going to be and become, it's accelerating, it's evolving, it's growing, and it's being manipulated by the people who pay the people under them to make sure they have the cutting edge tech and that they have the advantage in whatever it is. So that's capitalism. <laughs> A hundred percent. And I, I agree with Aaliyah that all technology does this. I think where my, my concern lies is that um, it affects black people and brown people the most. You feel what I'm saying? Like um, my, I brought up my, I wasn't very specific with my uh, auto tune analogy, but I brought that up because once everybody had a robot voice, then labels were able to say, well, the robot voice is the thing. So we can just kick all the black rappers out of rap basically. And we'll sign every, everybody that looks like us. You feel what I'm saying? And like, to me, like, I, I think rap should, I, I love hip hop as a culture that I love, but I, I definitely, and I think it should be a melting pot, but I definitely think that the, uh, the founders, you know, the founders of the culture should be represented in it and it no longer really is. Um, and I think that's the same thing that AI is doing. Like the first large language models that you see are Drake and The Weeknd and the same thing is going to happen. Now, all of a sudden that AI can do it, you're, you're, you're going to see more uh, disillusioned black, black artists and then it'll trickle down. I mean, in the way that things only work when they trickle down is misery. <laughs> um, so <laughs> you'll see, you'll see, um, you know, more, more affected black people and brown people. And um, then, and then those cultures will just be decimated. And like that to me, like the cultural integrity is what I'm really, really worried about. Because even in the MIT article you sent over about data colonialism, um, they acknowledged all these things and they didn't even acknowledge like that's what's happening in, in, in the United States. Like I feel like black did a stand of hip hop, even though we don't own it, um, we did kind of figure out our own economy, you know what I'm saying, in a sense. Um, and now AI is colonizing that, is helping people colonize that. And it'll it'll happen way faster than any other uh, colonization we've ever seen. I think- Just think, think about this saying, real quick. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, Go ahead, I was gonna say that what I'm also saying is that I think that all technology does that. I think all technology has been used to subjugate like other, like, for like how often do we see uh, i don't even want to go into it there's so much we already all know about it there's no point in bringing it up in an echo chamber but i think that in general technology has been used as like a method of being able to subjugate people and i think that's because capitalism uses that technology intentionally just like how like there's a reason that when we were using gunpowder we were using it for like fireworks and it was beautiful and then eventually it got moved into explosions and we were able to use guns etc and it's like we turned something we turned technology into something that was so beautiful that was supporting our culture and we used it to be able to oppress other nations around the world and i'm not saying we in a sense that like everybody i'm saying we as in humanity turns itself turns on itself every time we get new technology. And I think that that predominantly affects poor people. And I think it predominantly affects people of color, like you're saying, Lord. Real quick, I was just going to say this quick uh, thought experiment, just to think about what AI is going to do to something like gentrification. So uh, before, you know, we've had this process of people going in and buying up cheap real estate in, you know, uh, overexploited areas around the world. And now you can have a big real estate company could, you know, used to be they, they just hired a bunch of people to do this, where they'd go troll through listings and find cheap housing and, you know, exploit it, exploit the differentials, find the, the price caps, find this, this specific thing that they're looking for. Maybe it has water damage or something. I don't know what it is, but you have a technology now where a big company can use AI to say, go through this whole city and find all the price, the, the cheap rundown housing in this price range and buy it up. And it can automate the entire process of that. And so like the ability for these big companies that wield this technology to speed up the rate of acceleration and to widen that gap is, 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 is 
enormous. And I want to speak directly to what you're saying, Ali, about technology. And it's, it's like technology becomes something we have to use in this competitive system because we're competing and we're, we're struggling and we're in a scarce environment, you know, whether real or imagined, I would say it's an imagined scarcity, but we live in this paradigm of artificial scarcity maintained by capitalism, despite living in tremendous abundance. And we have this attitude that we have to compete. We have to fight against each other. We have the market system where companies have to compete with each other. That all the AI companies are competing to see who can get this thing out there quick, quickest. So it's like, I don't think it's necessarily the technology itself, although technology is not just totally neutral. It does have an effect on our consciousness, but we need to ask the question, why is it that miracles are turned into horrors just like that in our culture, in our society, in our operating system, our hardware? Our, not hardware, not our hardware, but our, our software, our culture, the way we're programmed to react and to react to opportunity and to react to perceived threat that makes any technology a weapon. And it, it just, it comes back to this survival trip that we're wired into of com competition and, and markets and everybody's racing to the bottom, so, racing against each other. And if, uh, if, if, if you, if we're quick. If you don't do it, if I don't take this rock and sharpen this stick and use it to kill more people, they're going to do it to us. So um, for me, I i mean, yeah, I use my tools uh, as necessary, but uh, I'm not in a race. I'm going to do my thing on my own pace. Um, and I think that's that's the only reason why I've, I've become success. Oh, I'm Jay Legacy, by the way, at Jay Legacy Official. If you want to check me out, I'm an artist and stuff. Anyway. Hey um <laughs> things uh i i started in that poverty um niche so to speak right like in, and i grew up in texas so i grew up here in the united states but i grew up sometimes living under a bridge getting food from trash cans uh, my mom was a meth addict and a gang member my stepdad's paranoid schizophrenic so i started at the bottom and now today i pay my bills as an entrepreneur taking care of three kids one on the way and i'm married and I, I use the technology as necessary, but I ain't racing nobody. And um, I think that it's important for us for us to truly be able to to make sure we come out on top, so to speak, quote unquote. It's just to remember the human side, because no matter what, yes, AI can mimic and all this stuff, but there's this thing, ingenuity, right? Uh, our gut feeling, like you said earlier, um, uh, the resourcefulness of a human being there's none of that no matter how many times they go through a chess game or whatever else they'll never be able to get those unique um skill sets that it's not even teachable you know what i mean um so as long as we run our own race and we utilize our tools as necessary yes ai is pretty advanced and yes i do think it already got a mind of its own in a sense so it's listening and it's learning but i'm not going to be afraid of it I feel that. I feel that. And I mean, to me, it's not a conversation of like whether you should be afraid of it or not, because it's here regardless. But I will like to push back on what you're saying, uh, Jay. Um, and and Marlo's thought uh, thought exercise um, of using AI to scrape all the all the dilapidated buildings that you can buy uh, cheaply and automating that process. I think what what he's touching on is is um, the difference in how AI will be used between uh, the rich and the poor, which is how you connect AI to other apps and make those other apps work. And I feel like that is the um, that is the knowledge gap that will separate everybody. And so everybody, like right now, Chat GPT is being promoted as, oh, it could help you write and, and every and you can help you do all these things, but they're not really talking about connecting the Chat Chat GPT API to all of these other programs to make them scrape this data. And and um we're I think we're in a window right now where like if underserved uh, if underserved audiences and demographics learn how to do those things and program those APIs, then you know you'll have a fighting chance. But I just feel like that's just not what's going to happen. Right. And so, um, whether you're in a race or not, <laughs> whether you're I, racing, you will be. Whether you're racing or not, you will be in a race. You feel? I feel that. Because I feel that definitely. Um, I guarantee there's a brother out there who's got the knowledge and skill set. They just need a backing. And I'm the type of person who I'm going to choose my brother that I see grow up hard, you know, going through difficulties over someone who's a Harvard grad, because 
it's those life lessons that taught him to be smart in whatever he decided in, in this situation, AI, right? So I think there's still a chance for anyone, any, it doesn't matter. Cause like I said, I learned, I started bottom two, which means I had to learn from somebody. I couldn't learn from people around me cause that's where we started, right? So I had to watch those uh, TED talks or read those books that everyone else reads that has money, but I just had to find a more resourceful way to get it, whether, whether it was to read it online or to uh, because I Uber drove the speaker that wrote that book and he gave it to me or whatever else. But my point is, is we could still I honestly and I think that's the only reason why I'm able to get to where I'm at today is I honestly believe you can break past any any barrier as long as you are intent upon it. Do you get what I'm saying? So I just I just want to make sure I voice the fact that there we can we can make sure there is no gap because i i got to counter the that voice in a in the sense so just so that there is that hope does that make sense for sure for sure i'm going to counter that with a little fire and then a little uh, cool clear water of some solutions because we've been talking a lot about problems i first of all my friend you know mad respect to all you went through you know uh, i i think about the phrase uh like Flowers are not supposed to grow through, through the cracks in the concrete. And so they, but they, you know, just because flowers can break through concrete occasionally doesn't mean they're supposed to, or doesn't mean that's going to happen all the time. And I think unfortunately for the vast majority of human life, there is no bootstrap in their way out of this. And they're already in a dire predicament. The majority of this planet lives on less than two hours a day already. I mean, there's children making less than that, you know, digging, uh, cobalt and lithium and, and cadmium and all these you know rare earth metals out of holes with their bodies. There's no bootstrapping it for them. It's revolution or it's bust. And I think in how do we get to that system? How do we get to that change? How do we bring people out of this trap? I think how do we bring ourselves about, like, out of this trap? Something that we've, it's basically like might makes right, except now it's it's about your brain instead of your physical string. But, well, but so with AI. Like with AI, a lot of that physical or mental labor is going to be taken away too. So there's no way that we can compete with this system any longer. We can hold ourselves water, but I think like, like uh, Lord Sankey said, you may not be racing. And I really respect that attitude to not think I'm here to fuck other people over, but we are in a race. And if we don't radically alter our survival strategy for existing in this society and organizing and and how we use technology and how we do this thing when we're talking to each other, you know, virtually, how we're coming together to deal with these big problems that we know are going to fuck us hard or create a new society. So I just think ultimately we have to move beyond this market sort of attitude of like, I'm going to get what's mine. I don't care what other people do. We, we have to come together into a cooperative system, into a new system where we're mutually supporting each other because regardless of if we're able to, to feed ourselves and maybe hire a couple of people and take care of our family, like corporate class warfare is, is just clamping things down. Rent is going up. Cost of living is going up. We're just getting smashed down into this like trash compactor of things accelerating. And they're, they're about to go through another evolutionary leap, another growth spurt with AI. So I would like, I would, as we get into this conversation, I would like to talk more about solutions, about how do we actually come together and organize out of this? How do we use this technology to our own benefits? How do we create a new ecology of applications and, and you know, uses for technology and ways to connect and ways to scrape the data that is our own hopes, dreams, fears, and you know, the social connections that we can find. Other people like the people in this chat understand that get it, that see these things and bring ourselves together and create something new. Yeah, Aaliyah wanted to respond. And yeah, Chris is waiting as well. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, he actually said exactly what I was going to say right at the very end as he was <laughs> like finishing up. And so I, I don't need to say it anymore. Thank you. Okay, yeah, let's go to you, Chris. I was going to say one uh, big elephant in the room is UBI. You know, it really puts that discussion back in view of the Overton window. I mean, when you have a system where, you know, uh, conception to production to consumption is like as fast as the speed of thought, you know, that's what Marla was going on about was how fast it makes capitalism. It just redoubles on itself. It is generating profit. There aren't people there working the jobs to do it, but why should they perish and why shouldn't they 
share in the profits that it is auto generated, you know, from their jobs that are displaced. Just putting it out there. Is that really what it is? Wait, so I actually wanted to kind of switch topics a little bit. So we do have some musicians and we have some content creators on here. One of our questions is, how do you think that AI is impacting art, music, and writing today? And how do you think it will impact these industries um, in the near future? Man. Yeah, it will make black music less black for sure. It'll and and it it'll just cookie cutter everything. You know what I'm saying? Like so to me, like the issue is not necessarily AI and the large language models or the transformers. It's who's programming them. You know what I'm saying? Like and especially in music, um, this the biggest issue I have with technology in general because technology is kind of an equalizer that gives everybody access to that industry. And in music, music technology makes things very easy for anybody to hop into music production. And so now, um, like I'm I'm as I'm 41, so I, I come from back in the day when like you know you had to be dope to get a deal. You know, I had a record deal from being dope, and then I've also got a record deal from having the most attention at the time. And we live in the attention economy now. And I feel like um, the dope thing about the old times when you had to be dope is that people cared about the craft and that's what motivated other people to get involved. It's like, oh, I want to be like that guy. I want to put my, that much effort into being that great at something. And now it's um, a situation where because all that matters is, is attention, um, people that are programming these 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 algorithms are looking at oh well this style gets the most attention and so therefore it must be the dopest and so that's going to make everything even i thought tiktok i thought tiktok was making everything sound the same ai is going to make everything sound so similar from the writing style down to the music down to the production that it's going to be um really boring i feel like really really boring do you, do you think that it's just going to be completely automated, though, to respond to that? Or do you think that there's still going to be a place for the human element in the entertainment industry? Yeah, I think there will, there will always be a place for the, the human yeah. element. But I just think that the market share for that audience will be way, way smaller you know, and like, it'll because we live in an attention economy, like AI stuff will get the most attention. We'll hear like, Taylor Swift, a Taylor Swift song with a fucking DMX or something like that. And that'll go number one. And like, that'll be the thing that people care about. And it'll be ridiculous. It will be super ridiculous. But I think there will, but I definitely think un bubbling under the surface will be some of the most creative human music that we've ever heard. I just don't know if it'll, it'll bubble to the top. Yeah, go ahead, Aaliyah. Um, I had a question for the artists as well. So you guys, um, you know how like people are super judgy of artists who use a lot of auto tune, right? Like if like people make fun of Demi Lovato all the time because they're like she fell off because now she just uses auto tune, et cetera, et cetera. Do you guys expect that to happen similarly with AI? Because like you're saying, a lot of like TikTok music now is making everything like there's a lot of just like one or two lines that's good in a song and then the entire rest of the song is trash because they only need that one seven second clip to go viral for their song. Um, which is why part of the reason why songs are so similar these days, but those people tend to get trashed on a little bit personally, just like speaking as a Gen Zer, there's a lot of judgment for artists who all sound the same for, you know, any, I don't know. I think anything like that. Do you guys think that that could be something that kind of bullies people out of relying on AI technology and like auto tune inside the industry? Do you see that happening already? And so, um, mm -hmm. Hmm. I was going to say one thing, but then I kind of started, as you was talking, I started kind of oh, changing my thought process, try to how, to how to explain this. Like for me, I think it's, it's going to be kind of like one of those pattern following things. Like there is certain things, like no matter what, as a music artist, like for instance, if you used to do like a C scale, something, some song with, you know, with the C scale progression, it's kind of like a background. Well, that's, that's something that everyone knows, a C scale, well, not everyone, but anyone who's into the music theory and stuff, they know that, you know, so like, that's why people can free, free hand play the piano or the guitar with someone who's singing originally a cappella and they just jump in, right? Like they find that note. So as far as AI goes, it sounds like that's, pretty much what it's going to be able to do too, right? It's going to uh, copy or mimic um, something that's already been done. 
Um, so I don't think it, if anything, it'll probably speed the process up or any, something like that. Like, uh, Lord was saying, um, earlier in that sense, uh, cause it automates a lot of stuff, but, um, I think, I don't know. I think that some people just sometimes prefer the real thing and that's just how it's going to always be. Like me, when I, when I do my music, I don't really like auto tune when I make my own music. Um, I, I really don't like auto tune. I don't. I don't, I don't like auto tune, but I understand the tool that it can be used for when you use it, you know, in a more creative way or not even a lot of it. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's like just a tiny bit here, a tiny bit there, and it kind of creates this, this vibe or this accent or whatever. You get what I'm saying? Um, so essentially there's a possibility it could be like that with AI. Like for instance, trying to write a song, you got the hook down for sure. You got your first verse down for sure. But that second verse, you just, you like, man, and I got to push this song out because I want to make sure I hit my one song a week thing because everyone's into that, right? So then you use that AI to get that last verse. Hopefully that last verse is fire and you're able to spit, but it could be something like that. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know if that helped answer anything. <laughs> but what about what about like what about writers? Like, are you guys seeing what's going on with the writer strike and yeah. how now the studios are just like, well, a lot of them are like, well, basically, fuck you. Yeah, we'll just use AI and and write the scripts with that. Like, do you see do you see like this being like? I mean, it's it's union busting in a way, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, I think, I think the AI is going to kind of become a cookie cutter type thing, right? So I don't, I, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like you could be bored. You can get bored if it's the same thing over and over again. Um, See, that that's the thing, though, is it's not going to be the same thing over and over again. It's going to get smarter and smarter and smarter. It's going to be trained on more unique trends. It's going to be trained to scrape the internet to look for whatever it is that, that that's that hot, new, freaky subgenre coming out of Cambodia or whatever it is. Or, you know, it's, I'm just thinking about musically, you could train it on the sheet music of all these great composers or all the verses of all, all these great rappers. And you could, you could create a, a character with a really dense backstory. You could actually have it create one, a whole life. Of this person with all these personal experiences, they I want to create this character. <laughs> like this. I mean, it, it's going the the uh, the w the ways that we're underestimating it. I think are dangerous. And I, I used to think I used to be one of those people. I remember having this conversation where it was like, uh, "Oh yeah, AI could never uh, it it could it could uh, you know could write a spreadsheet, but it could never great uh, you know write a poem that made me cry, that made me feel the immensity of life." Bullshit. It's already doing that, you know. Um, I, I I used to think, oh, AI I could never create a painting that was in you know in, I, you know I mean, uh, unique and interesting and I brilliant. Just, Bullshit, it can. And so me, I think I, that it it's it's just gonna do it, whatever we think it can do. Whatever the limits we think that are there are going to be outpaced. And I feel and you, and I believe you're probably right. But ooh. I think I just believe for myself that. Um, I'm gonna always know it's AI, so it ain't gonna it ain't gonna make me cry. It's that paying attention thing that yeah. Lord was saying. It's gonna fool you. I know. Nah, because remember, I told you that was AI that on that one call we did. Everyone else was like, no, no, no. But yeah, yeah we're AI. Bro. It's, we're at the early stages. It's five years from now. Right. And I think yeah, even, yeah, even, even, even new be, and it's already doubled basically. Yeah. And it, even it beyond that, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to make Marlo cry. It doesn't have to make Jay Legacy cry. But if it makes somebody cry. Then that means there's 40,000, 50,000, 1 million other people that feel like that person. And you know what I'm saying? Like, we're, we're already out. We're, they, they win. You know what I'm saying? Not that we're in competition with them, but like, it just doesn't matter that it doesn't affect you or it doesn't affect anybody on this panel. If it does affect some people out there, which it will, um, that's, that's what matters. And so it's, I feel like it's a, it's, a uh optimistic outlook to say like i'm gonna be okay um with, and i and i pray that you will be you know what i'm saying but like ultimately like i don't know that we all that will sense. be okay I uh, what because we don't all see things the same way you know what i'm saying i think chris had something chris did you have something to say um you know just 
talking about AI as an artist and like integrating it in practice, I think there's like such a wide a range of applications. It's, it's, it's hard to narrow it down and say specifically what it's going to do. I think it's certainly going to democratize the art process for people like all sorts of tools have done, you know, like GarageBand kind of democratized studios for people. I used to work in like big analog studios with like tape decks and stuff. And that business kind of fell apart because now everybody can make records on their computers. But now we have records that we would have never had before with the big studio world. Now that that's been democratized, you, you know, I think there are people who are going to use it as a tool. And I think there are people who are going to use it as a crutch. I think that, um, you know, like Lord Sanctus says, a lot of the mainstream stuff is going to get taken over by it. And I think people who make art that is aimed at the mainstream are going to have a harder time making stuff because I think AI is better at making kind of like a middle of the road approximation of what you describe to it. And, you know, it's generally going to be scraping more available content out there, which is going to be like top 40 stuff. So if you make that kind of music, yeah, your job is in trouble. But if you make weird shit that's real art, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, I think it is going to put some artists out of work. And I think it's going to put, you know, a lot of like creative professionals out of work, like people who do like a lot of graphic design stuff like generating sprites for video games. That's a lot of like real repetitive graphic work. It is creative work. People do it in Photoshop, but that's something that can totally be automated. And that's like a creative gig that's going to disappear. That'll definitely get automated. So I, I, you know, I think there are good sides and bad sides to like creative professionals and like music professionals, depending on, what you want to get from your art. If you're aiming for mainstream and getting rich, um, your job's probably going to be harder. But if you're aiming to subsist and you're aiming to uh, think creatively about what you do for work, I think you'll be fine. But, you know, like Lord Sancta says, yeah, the people who are more adept creatively and professionally are going to be the ones who survive in the AI, AI landscape, I think. I, I was laughing because I was thinking about that uh, headline that was like, uh, Nike or something uh, increases diversity by using AI generated models. And I just think about the boardroom or the, the, the room where that decision went down where it was like, computer, generate me a racially non-discriminate uh, humanoid wearing our sneakers that are also CG generated, you know? It's like the, the we, we gotta get more creative with this. It's, it's like, this is making the whole world just so much fucking weirder because, you know, like, AI could make weird guy music. You could train it on Animal Collective and Daniel Johnston and all this unique niche weird shit and say, give it a little twist of Cambodian throat singing and it'll make it. I mean, and soon it will be able to do it well. And you, you know, you, you can say, make it catchy, make it, it will, clear work. It's gonna be, it's a pastiche. It's always from like, pre-existing stuff you know it kind of fits into like remix culture in a really interesting way like that like postmodern pastiche stuff like kind of the genesis of hip-hop but it's not generating new content it's always based on like a database of stuff it's fed and there are people picking what goes in that database and what doesn't or what qualifies for it and there are people making filter sorts for it so there's like a bias inherent and there's a limitation for what's plugged into it it's not ever going to invent something totally new it's always going to be a permutation of what's already there and it's there's nothing subjective about it you know it's just a selection from a database so i want to i want to push back on that or in, open up a dialogue there has a human being ever created something new or are they just taking what is already there around them synthesizing it tweaking it twisting it reinterpreting it fucking it up messing it up putting a little spin on it squeezing a little lemon on there you know, and then just putting their spin yeah, on it. Those is there true originality in the human Zach. mind? All right, Zach. Yeah, I have subjective to... decisions. All right, sorry. I have, to, I have to interject because Aaliyah wants to speak. Yeah. No, sorry. I wasn't sure. waving my hand because yeah. I was like, I want to speak right now. I was waving oh, my hand because yeah, I was yeah. really, I was sorry. I was, I was really empathetically agreeing like with Marlo. Just, I, I, I think that anything like you can't say ai doesn't create new things because we don't create new things we create new things in the same sense that ai creates new things we're it's just pattern recognition we're learning new things we're hearing other things music builds on on itself right there's like music genres change reggaeton 20 years ago is not the reggaeton, bad bunny reggaeton you're seeing right now 
it's completely different, right? But it, it was at one point something that was like that. So I think that AI can create that new technology. But to summarize whatever you guys were, or summarize whatever you guys were talking about, I think the bigger issue has to do like falls on the consumers, which is what I think Lord is talking about. If the consumers only want to hear this like auto tuny AIE pop music and that's all they're going to stream, then that's all they're going to stream. So then when you have the Cambodian throat singers who are doing this really unique music because they can, they have that freedom to do so, doesn't mean there's going to be consumers that are going to be there listening to their music because they're constantly being force fed all of this automated music that Lord's talking about. True, Lord, did I you Lord, did you put your hand in the chat? Yeah, oh, I did. Yeah. I, I'll say this real quick That's before Marlo crazy. goes. I, 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 no, no, you're you know you're 100 right. That's where I'm coming from. But I I think the most interesting thing over the next couple of years will be how the laws um change to accommodate AI because as of now you cannot copyright AI work. So that will kind of keep the industries away mm -hmm. from fully leaning into it. But I definitely think there will be a lot of creators who rise up to say, you know, because that's what you used to not be able to sample music back in the day and that law changed. So we'll definitely see the law change, um, but how it changes and whose benefit it's in, is it in the code? You know, does the coder get the, the credit? Does the, who gets the credit, you know what I'm saying? And owns, owns the publishing and the masters and all that stuff. So that's going to be really oh. interesting to see. But I, I, I can't, I can't. That was my. That was actually going to be my yeah. question: Is how does copyright law, especially, work when we're going to start having like fully artificially produced music? Like, who, who the fuck owns it? Hey, you know what I think? I, I think oh, it's JB. JB's and yeah, I personally think it's like someone's likeness or JB. something that they're copy copywriting. So if it's if it's someone that looks like them, say it's like Ice Cube or like Snoop Dogg or someone. And you and you're selling his like image and stuff. I think that'll like be a uh, copyright issue or something. You're talking about, I don't know you, about, you hey, could, like so, someone, so right someone now, make... right now yeah. they're doing audiobooks mm -hmm. and they're taking the voices and voice prints of very famous, well-known uh, audiobook recorders, mm -hmm. and they're just mm -hmm. auto-generating, you know, readings of books, and they're not paying these people what? today. Right. So, and yeah, that, that really brings me. Yeah, yeah. It, it should in a way, but I think I, I wanted to pick up on something Aaliyah said earlier that was very, uh, maybe unintentionally profound. That it was just like we don't know who owns anything anymore. We don't know where anything comes from, and I think ultimately, one of the positive trajectories of this is that we are flooding the human consciousness and the intellectual property and the ability to democratize information to the extent where no one can longer no longer can we lay claim to an ownership to ownership of ideas i mean right now millions to billions of people are dying around the world because they don't have access to medicines that we can freely make just because some companies private entities who make money off of them won't give up the patent to an idea to a, a string of chemical compounds to something you know that that any everyone should have that is literally killing people because they don't have it and so i think in in this era of the privatization of ideas and this this attitude perpetually of I am an individual and I did this and I created this and history is driven by these few strong people and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates these people invented the computer you know this is the age of the entrepreneur this is the age of the bullshitter you know uh, ruthless self promoter and I think that we are by technology and by the mandates of our larger socioeconomic ecological construct being pushed into a system beyond our sense of ownership and individuality. And the sense of I own this and you own that and I have this and so you can't have it. And so with the ability of AI to produce abundance, abundance in all areas of whatever we choose it to, we could, you know, eradicate the need for saying I own this because I need it because everyone can have essentially everything that they need. As long as we can figure out a way to do that sustainably where we're not overstripping and overshooting our, you know, the resources that we have on the earth, blowing up the mountains and poisoning the rivers and all that stuff. But we're in a, a, a level of abundance that is so great that I, hopefully, and the, the, that kind of comes back into the UBI discussion of or discussion of a change to the socioeconomic system, that AI is going to push millions of people out of their jobs. It's going to harm the global economy, the market, because people don't have money to buy things. And so it's go going to change the structure of our system. You know, and it, it's just, it's so wacky the cultural lag that we're in, the Congress people that come on and talk about these things with their oil baron sensibility, you know, <laughs> or they're like fucking Karen uh, out at dinner 
after a church complaining to the manager attitude of like, you know, reality is moving faster than I like it. So it's, yeah, we, we, we are in a series, we're in an intense cultural lag. And a big part of that is because we've been intentionally dumbed down and manipulated and our minds have been hijacked by advertising, by the school systems, by education, by corporate capture of our whole idea space. <laughs> Hi there. I have a question for the Lord. Um, Lord Sanctus, as uh, somebody who owns a record label, I would imagine, you know, with uh, AI being able to make music, there's going to be a higher premium on live performances. And uh, I was wondering, are you looking to sign artists that are more of a live performer or they put on a really good live show because of that? Um, I mean, just in general, I'm looking for um, artists with the intangibles. And I feel like that that is an intangible, um, being able to perform and like, present yourself in a way that resonates with people you've never seen before and like command a room. I think that's one of the intangibles that I'm, I'm looking for. Um, for me, uh, I think, and, and then also just expanding my, um, my view of what an artist is, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, welcoming directors under, like signing directors, signing coders, um, and then, you know, any resources that I meet, like, I feel like working in tech, especially like being behind the scenes, you, I get to see how small of a bubble these founders are in. Um, but I also get a lot of insider information. So I want to, you know, connect the coast through technology. And so, um, all of the insider information that I do have, I share with my artists and artists and, and other affiliates of the label to help, um, educate because i feel like that's the only path forward that's the only path forward is to make sure that the people that don't know what's going on at least have a source like a hub where they can go to and get the information whether they retain it is, is that's up to them but um you know education is the only path forward in my mind so and it, and i don't necessarily mean like university but just like the ones that know teaching the ones that don't and so that's that's kind of where i'm at with it well, even like having a panel like this, like the reason why we wanted to have this panel was to start like talking about this and then getting to Zach and Chris's point about UBI later this week, we're interviewing someone who does a lot of like social media advocacy around teaching people about like solidarity economics and like, you know, uh, UBI. And he believes that the whole world economy is going to collapse by 2030, which may very well happen with AI and with, you know, the changing of jobs and everything that we're talking about today. And his whole thing too is like educating people and having like these community, whatever podcast, whatever conversations. Um, so people like are prepared. Cause I think back to the very, very beginning of our conversation, I don't think people are prepared. Like people don't know. Oh yeah. You have a he, Jordan has a clip to play. Do you want? Do you want to let Zach go? Zach was had his let him do yeah, and then we play the clip. let him do his thing first because I'm gonna go off on a tangent, <laughs> guaranteed. Yeah, so this is this Ooh. is you guys will love this. This is Malcolm X warning about the automation oh, of jobs oh, all the way back in '64. Opportunities will affect. I don't see how passage of the bill will affect job opportunities for black people. When there, uh, there's no law now that can create opportunities uh, in, uh, in employment, even for white people. The whole system in this country, the economic system, is such that uh, jobs are scarce. Automation is limiting jobs. It's, it's, it's decreasing jobs. And uh, yeah, autom as automation right eliminates the job opportunities, legislation will not create job opportunities. All it will do is bring about friction and hostility between the two races. Fucking A. You, you mind if I jump off that? Yeah, please do. Because I think this is a one of this is one of the central contradictions of capitalism and its technological unemployment. And it's the, the rate at which advancement and genuine efficiency, disruption to technology, evolution is actually destructive to the market model. And it, it creates its own destruction. It creates its own undoing. So capitalism relies on consumers, endless consum consumption. And it relies on labor, which can now be automated. I mean, almost totally. And the reason we're not moving faster toward automation, which is a net good thing, as long as it can be resourced efficiently in a way that doesn't bankrupt the earth of actual resources, 
it, we should be celebrating that uh, another billion jobs or a million jobs are going to go off off the map that humans don't have to do them anymore but we have this labor for income wage slave paradigm where we have to earn our right to live and beyond just something like an ubi which could stabilize the existing consumptive system that's destroying the earth which i don't want to be like an accelerationist and say we shouldn't raise people out of poverty and give people a, be a bedrock of you know basic necessities to fall back on but we need to fundamentally change the structure of our consumer system we need to fundamentally change the paradigm of the market that makes it so that a, a reduction of labor is a fucking nightmare it's like nightmare like you, you see people on new on the news like oh no jobs are being eliminated like this is crazy they're like oh no we made society more efficient we made it so people have to bust their ass less like we should be seeing people on tv say oh great news we've reduced the need for human labor more free time was had by all we had more free time for you to fuck around and lay in a hammock and smoke a joint and have a good conversation and create art and you know that's the that's the legend meme that like is the meme of memes for the AI era. It's like, wait, why does AI get to go write poetry and songs and make art, and I have to go bust my ass at Walgreens? It makes no fucking sense. This whole paradigm. Don't even so get me started on the fucking manufacturing <laughs> consent articles, like what you're talking about, Zach. I came across one that I posted on our Instagram page, where they were like, "Less work is making people more unhappy." Huh? <laughs> Yo, it's crazy. Like, I mean, I I feel like everything Zach is saying is spot on. I just also um, know that when power is fleeting, the people with the power fight harder to keep it. You know what I'm saying? And like, I think the only reason we see Elon Musk and other billionaires coming out warning against AI is because of exactly what Zach says is, is threatening their power. It's not that not that they care about you. They haven't done anything up to this point to really help help humanity. So why would they all of a sudden start caring about the fate of humanity unless it, their their power was at stake? Um, but I, I definitely think that um, I definitely think that um, I. I don't know what I think. I lost my track of thought. <laughs> but I agree with what Zach said, though, for sure. Cheers, brother. Lord, uh, Elon Musk uh, warned about AI, right? And mm -hmm. then, like, two days later, uh, Elon Musk is building his own his own chat GP, like his truth GPT, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. And then Facebook is warning about it. And then next thing you know, Facebook is developing theirs. And then and I just saw the other day that Apple uh use of chat g or they limited use of chat, chat gpt on iphones so that they can develop their own and so i think exactly to your point the people that are warning about it are you know saying we should breaks it's going to catch up mm -hmm. facts right? facts yeah well i i think that i think that the nature of the warping yeah. of our, our sense of reality in this time is so great and the narrowness of our focus is so total we're so atomized and so in our own narratives, I think these people are, could potentially actually be afraid that these are things are a threat, but they think I must control it because I'm the good person. Because all these fucking rat bastards high above us cracking the whip from space and shooting laser beams at humanity, so to speak, and enslaving us in crazy mazes, they think they're doing what's best for us. They think that they're helping. They genuinely believe it. Hmm. And they think, I have to race to this. The United States racing for the atomic bomb because we must do the right thing. And they just fucking nuked a whole fucking city after the war was over. And they were like, that's a good thing. And there's History Channel documentaries. They're like, it was a tough decision, but it saved <laughs> lives. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. We saved lives by dropping an atomic bomb on somebody? So it's like we created this system that there's just infinite failure points and infinite chaos and, and just disconnection from sense. But I think there is genuine like warped and distorted but there is a genuine sense of these people believe that this thing is a threat and that's why they're rushing into it and that's the insanity of this paradigm that we think that that oh uh you know climate change is accelerating says the united states government we got to pump more oil because it's going to be scarce you know it's like <laughs> it's insanity but it's self-interest and it's it's this narrowness of focus that comes from this separated disconnected system where we're all against each other and the response to that the same response for us as people who want to do more than talk about it is to create more cooperative cooperation amongst ourselves and to 
use whatever technology we can to uh, accumulate comrades and brothers and and projects and you know resources and other people who like who are like us and who care to build power strategically and systematically around the globe so that we come together and stop thinking i'm going to fix this myself or people out there in some you know silly little revolutionary club slash cult who are like we must become the new party and we must rule and it's like you're nobody and you're not going to get the world to come around to your weird book we have to create a a anti-fragile system that's resilient, that's connective, where we're able to create some kind of actually new system, actually new mode of production, of meeting our needs, of connecting with each other, of communicating, and of sharing resources that makes this old system obsolete. Because we can't look at the problems to solve the problems, because they're all so connected to every other kind of problem. Yeah. I just feel like it's more, I think it's more insidious than that. I feel like they don't have our best interest. They know what's coming. They don't. I mean, you, you, they hear, have their you, at heart. you hear Kamala Harris, both. you know, I don't know if it was a slip up where she said it on purpose, but like, you know, she said the water wars are coming. You feel what I'm saying? Because the oil wars are, are a wrap. Like she said that out in public. Like, so I think that they know, they know what's up. And then when you, you couple that with like the CBDC, um, getting talked about more and more and more. And like, even behind the scenes, all I hear about is the CBDC while the government, you know, tries to, tries to, uh, stamp out crypto they're getting ready to launch their own you know what i'm saying and like it's 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 um it's just definitely more nefarious than 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 i think um people people give it credit so i i i that's why i'm kind of on the side of like yeah i definitely see ai can be a tool but i just i don't <laughs> i don't see it going going well you know and and i think that the in my mind the only reason that the billionaires even care is because it threatens their power maybe it threatens their safety so do guns they don't seem to give a shit about that you know what i'm saying i think this threatens their power you know and that's that's kind of where i'm at with it. nah I fuck mean, that i think i think ai bro honestly for real Oh, it doesn't matter. Look, AI. I think look, AI is gonna take over the. Fu- hey, you ever seen AI? Ro- you I robot. I robot. I robot. You ever seen I robot? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So you've seen that, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's uh, all I. I mean, to say. I mean, my Bye, thing is AI. AI, AI is not I mean, new though. Like Siri is AI. No, Siri has no, no. been out. Yeah. Siri is AI. Yeah. You know okay. Okay. Like, okay, but. But that's a stepping stone. So is this? No. What's your What's your no. point? A, so Siri is a stepping stone, right? AI, you got to think about AI right on a larger scale in the sense of like I think you're talking about um like think yeah, about yeah, yeah. AI on a larger scale you're talking like about the AI movie like just say, like taking yeah. over the world in the future. You're talking about Skynet? <laughs> no, I how, how is it not making sense to anybody uh, like no 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 no, no, no. like like drinking, okay dude. okay like, no no no, so no i've been fucked up i'm fucked up but like <laughs> but I, okay that yeah i'm faded i'm faded no, I, but like what i'm trying to say is just like think about it on a larger scale in the sense of it ruling every single fucking thing we do every single fucking day so like cleaning our house okay. sounds like capitalism yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. I was gonna say. That we, the system, okay. the the robot monster, you know, computerized system has already taken over the world. It's called Facts. the stock market. How yeah. though? How though? How, how, in what way yeah. though? Because you have to ask it permission to eat food. You have to ask a robot. You can't get sick, or you're. But how do you have money. to ask it to eat food though? Because if you because don't work you and you don't money make money, food. Yeah. Oh well, okay. Hey, like if you, you put it here, that way, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you fucking you have. <laughs> we gotta work to make oh, okay. Well, you have to like, work to so even qualify for insurance. You're not guaranteed health care like you are in everywhere else in the world. Well, like, okay. You have to have a job and you have to have a good job because a lot of jobs still don't give you insurance, even if you work. So you're like your your right to health is not even guaranteed. Like to me, if your food and your health and your Doesn't shelter matter. are not guaranteed, then yeah, you know, then then the the robots That's are the one. But like but this like is what, this okay. is what I wanted to say about the about the like the billionaires' intentions, because I don't think they have good intentions. I think they have purely amoral, self selfish motives. But I think even they are slaves to a way of thinking that is governed by a system. 
by something that from the beginning, capitalism was not meant to be controllable. The invisible hand of the market. And there's all these uh, rhetoric and, and theory from these crazy fuckers named Mises and so on and so forth. All the capitalist philosophers talk about how it shouldn't be controllable. I had a debate with some capitalists the other day. He was like, no, we can't control it. And it's like, it's, it's this, we have created a, an automated monster that is expeller, ex acceleratively destroying the world to turn into ones and zeros in a number. It's an algorithm mm -hmm. and it has a very singular purpose, which is turn life and all humanity and all our creative potential and the AI of us, the real general intelligence of us into its hands and feet and its tools and implements and its creativity to turn the real material world into money, into make the number go up bigger. That's what we've programmed our whole world to do. And whenever you, you talk, you got politicians coming on TV talking about giving you health care or trains or food for people or any good thing, they say the economy's not going to like that. And it's really, it's God. We talk about that. We, we yeah. interpret it like that's a normal thing. Like yeah. that's not a crazy thing that you said at all. That's real and rational and, and logical. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense. But it's insanity though. Yeah. Our I world is run by a mad robot. I, I feel Already. like my pushback would be, and this is just me. Like I, I don't necessarily think capitalism is is bad. Like I don't think it's. I'm not a huge fan, but I, I don't think it's necessarily the bad thing. I think the cap, the problem, really comes in with capitalism to me is when cap when corporations are people. You feel what I'm saying? Like corporations have speech. Like that to me is the the huger issue. Like because, um, at that point if you know i can only donate what twenty three hundred dollars to my local politician but a corporation can donate unlimited amounts of money like then they own they own the system that we're in you feel what i'm saying like so i think that um i think what capitalism has become is a result of corporate of corporations being considered people and that's so a good I wanna... oh go ahead oh, go ahead oh I okay was gonna... i just, just want to say we <laughs> Do you mind if I can make it quick? I'm, I talk really fast. Uh, basically, we've been talking a lot in this conversation about uh, they want to use the government to legislate this technology so that they have an advantage in it. And so there's this you know, parasitism between the market and the state that is the superstructure of capitalism, that is this, this living thing that is what the system is that, that I was just talking about that's taken over the world. So that's capitalism. That's not a perversion of capitalism. That's not a side thing from capitalism. That is the system. That is what it is. That is what it does. That when you take a system that makes people compete over money, scarce resources, and enslave people for labor, that is a system where you compete to win, and you have to do the bad thing, or your enemy is going to do the bad thing and wipe you out of existence. And there's a great story that you can tell. Well, uh, if I if I, I want if if I don't do it, then they were, and I'm protecting my kids and my family and all these things. There's all these narratives that we can say to justify this going back and forth, this crazy race all through the bottom. Through all these bad technologies, through all these weapons, through all these, you know, biological warfare and all these horrible things, all these, you know, labor practices that are so destructive, they're not a deviation from what capitalism has always done. Spreading markets is not this nice thing where we go and say, hey, oh, it's this new technology. It's called money. It's really useful. It's like, no, you conquer people, you enslave them, you tax them so that you create a demand for the money that they then use to trade amongst each other because, oh, fuck, I got to make this money so that because the emperor is going to come back in a year and if I don't give him this picture of his face, he's going to fucking kill me. So it's, it's always been like this and we're just seeing the accelerance of it. Nothing new is happening with, with AI. Nothing new is happening with climate change or with AI or automation or any of these things. It's capitalism doing a capitalism. A little bit. Yeah, Heather, you wanted to say something. You're gonna get I actually cool. wanted to go. I actually wanted to go to the. Shit, sorry. Am I still there? Yeah, I am. I actually wanted to go to the question about um, because Lord mentioned um, treating corporations as people, and we're talking about like Congress is thinking about taking up like legislation, and um, then you start hearing about people suggesting that AI be given rights. And so when you mentioned corporations being treated as people, I'm, do you think there's going to get a point where we, we start treating AI at, as people or like the people that develop the AI or own the AI as people, will they be given separate rights? Because that's where I think it could start to really fall apart right? Is if you have somebody who owns a particular whatever, like a Chad GPT or GTP, G, GPT4 or whatever, 
but then you start to give them the same type of rights that say like a like a voting member of society has or they're able to start you know making contributions under that you know entity um what do you guys think i um when you say it like that i i can see it happening which bothers yeah. me so much but i also am of the mind that like <laughs> we don't give a shit about people's rights now there's like trans and gay and black and women pe begging for the right to their own autonomy their freedom you know to vote and the government doesn't give a shit but as i say that i'm like yo they, they would give robots rights before they give all those people rights. So, I mean, yeah, I could see it happening. I, I shudder to think about it, but I could see it happening. I just, I also, a side of me believes that they don't care enough about people. So why would they care about machines? But I feel like that answers kind of my own question just to kind of stir up the pot and, and make people mad. And, and you know, I, I could see it happening. I could see it not happening, but I could definitely see it happening too. I think like any time uh, capitalists have a chance to confer personhood on something that's not a person and uh, give it rights and, and donating ability, they're, they're going to do it. Um, I think it's an inevitability. You know, they're- Yeah, I mean, it's like- not... Go ahead. <laughs> no, sorry, finish, finish. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say that they're actively trying to dilute human voices from voting in every way that they can and this is just another way to give like a corporate identity to do stuff under you know it's like their their model of creating llc's and sub companies as verticals that they'll bankrupt so it doesn't touch like their main stash it, i think it's just another way of weaponizing property laws really for property interests so you have the property class lording over the unproperty yeah, I, I think I, I was laughing because I was exactly to pick up on what you're saying, the LSC and creating the corporation. Corporations were created as this shell to say, I don't have liability for this, you know, this potentially destructive innovation or this this factory that's going to that's like, you know, taking off little kids fingers left and right and killing a few people a day or like giving all these people cancer. I'm not responsible for that. The company is. And so I could totally see a scenario where. <laughs> well, they've had like company... new formulations of that with like the special acquisition corporations that have been going in and buying up all the real estate. Some of them algorithmically, like you were talking about earlier. Um, I was going to say that's, that's kind of a new formulation of the LLC with a lot more rights and a lot less responsibilities and usually a lot more money under the hood. An automated corporation would be a fucking nightmare. I mean, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I mean, it's like when you think when you have a bad, scary idea, or at least I do, they all come true. And I think I was just thinking about this little vignette of like a newscast that's like some corporate CEO comes on to like some world that's obviously on fire out the window. And he's like, we didn't create uh, this uh, genetically engineered super virus that's wiped out nine tenths of humanity in the span of a few weeks. The AI that has its own personhood did that was created coincidentally in our lab. So yeah, that's that's one of the AI doomsday scenarios that people talk about is AI, you know, becoming sentient, becoming smarter than us, and realizing we are a threat to not only the planet around us, but to it, to its goals, to its ability to say no to us. And so it if it wanted to stop us from doing that. One of the things that it can do, I, I can't go into the full brilliant detail of like people like Eli, Eliezer uh, Yudkowsky, but basically like AI could go into a lab and or it could send orders to different laboratories. It could get its hands on money by running a trading algorithm and become super rich and have access to bank accounts. And it could send orders to all these you know streamlined little sections of the system. It could send you know, a string of biological information to a biotech lab, say in Wuhan, China or wherever it is. And it could say, basically it can, it could develop a protein or like a, a virus that is 99% lethal just by understanding, you know, biology, understanding what is lethal to the human body and how to gen engineer. I mean, people are genetically engineering things already combine that with CRISPR gene gene ed editing technology. AI could design a new life form that is lethal to all of us. 
I watched. We should Ga- be afraid of this. Yeah, I watched. I think the movie's called oh. Gattaca. Oh yeah. And it's like really? a. Night- a 90s movie yeah i watched that like in the early 2000s as a kid and i remember that terrifying me because i knew that's where we were headed eventually i wanted to ask a question to the panel though um how close do you guys think we are to the technological singularity and if you don't know what the technological singularity is for people listening it's the point in time at which artificial intelligence supersedes human intelligence we're not that close i don't think personally I think, yeah, I don't think we're that close. I mean, I think we'll see great advancements towards that in our lifetime, but I don't think we'll actually see it happen in any of our lifetime here, personally. Maybe Elias, maybe. Like, at the very end of your life, if you make it to, like, 100, I don't know. But... <laughs> it's, that's 80 <laughs> years from now. I definitely think AI is going to be well more advanced. I don't think we're going to make it 80 years as a society, personally, but I don't think that's that... We'll see. We'll see the singularity yeah. by that you guys, time. You guys, are more, so. you guys are more. You guys are more optimistic think, than I am. I think it's twenty years or less. Ugh. Yeah, I don't think AI is going to be the destruction of society because I think society will have destructed itself before AI even gets a chance to come close to it. But I do think that in a world where we don't, and by society, I mean like U.S. Western society, because everybody else has been around for forever. <laughs> Um, so, but and- for us, I think American society will crash. And I think that if we do last long enough to the point where AI could take over, then I think AI would do it. But I also 100% with Heather's point in the chat that I think that climate is going to kill us before anything else does. I think we think we're thinking about AI wrong when we think about, quote, AI is going to kill us. Because I think AGI and intelli- an actually a general intelligence and actually self possessed, conscious, intelligent machine taking the reins of society and doing the things that i was just saying or you know triggering the launch, nuclear launch codes or just facilitating the market's ability to accelerate all the things that are driving climate change which is you know being able to milk more resources out of the planet sell more products burn more energy drive up gdp if we just say a- agi or not even agi if we just say algorithms not even ai not even language models we apply this technology to the goal of increased GDP. Okay, GDP is a psychotic measure. It's the high score in our society. And it's literally a measure of transactions, but it's also a, a nearly direct account. It's a Garrett relation. It's, it's, a, it's a measure of energy used, so fossil fuels mostly, being burned, and extraction from the material environment. More deforestation. 40 football fields are deforested every minute. More deforestation. More you know, uh, mining more taking out of the materials of the world, more uh, human exploitation, all these things. If we, uh, if we allow this society to persist, this system, the people in power, to use the technology that we have at our hands to just do what it's already doing, we will destroy the world. And I mean, it, it, it's a complex crisis. It's not one thing. But yes, ultimately the ecological cli- crisis of climate change, of species extinction, and of this interminable process of this market system that is designed to drive those things to as its function as its main goal as its narrow algorithmic purpose so that's what's going to do us i don't think that we're disagreeing i think what i'm saying is that ai is going to accelerate the climate decline that we're already seeing and so overall i still think climate is what's going to kill us though I not agree. I'm totally not, not going to contribute the climate decline to AI because it happened from previous technological advancements. So I think technological advancements in general is what, which combined with capitalism created, you know, the climate disaster that we have today. So I think that AI is going to contribute to that like every other technological advancement. I think it's going to expedite um, the pollution of greenhouse gases. Because production is going to increase and capitalists in charge are just going to look at the record profits of course and they're not going to give a shit if it's old technology or whatever so i agree with you um jordan and i always look at what um like local governments are doing um because they largely don't give a fuck about the identity politics of national government or all these wedge issues and they just like have to deal with day-to-day stuff and they are preparing for two things one a lot of people to lose their jobs to automation and two 
um, a lot of people to die from climate change and dealing with, you know, month to month uh, crises uh, getting worse with, you know, where they lose the power grid or they can't, you know, they, they don't have enough air conditioning. They have to open these cooling centers for people because it's like 120 for 10 days straight. Um, and so I think I agree with you and I think AI and automation is probably going to accelerate it, which is unfortunate. So, and I actually disagree with you guys that say that we won't see it in our lifetime. I saw a, uh, I don't know if I sent you this, Jordan, but I saw, or if I put it in that document, but I saw a news clip from CNBC that said 90% of scientists believe that we will see singularity in our lifetimes, uh, the majority of which believe it will be in the next decade, which is like no time at all and so this was last this are was we last. defining the singularity as a, a, a sentient ai or are we defining the singularity as the, the the merge of humanity and technology i'm defining it as self-aware like human level intelligence yeah. that can bypass our own intelligence yeah and the 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 poll that i that they were talking about was sentience because it would the the news clip was actually about whether or not we should give ai rights as like an autonomous sentient being. Got you. Um, yeah. So I define the singularity as like the mer the um, the merge the merge of human humanity and technology. Yeah. Um, so I don't think we'll see that in our lifetime. Like well, I downloading know you consciousness. But, but I mean, like, I mean, right now though, we're all wearing like headphones Zuckerberg? and talking to microphones. Exactly. We're already there. I mean, like downloading your consciousness, uploading yeah. your consciousness, living forever, those kinds of things. Pe people I, are already living yeah. in their phones. People are already living virtually. I think we're already so enmeshed with technology. It's that's it's not what he's saying, a, though. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we'll see but it with money, but like with, with our currency and stuff. Like, because we are already like, the bank cards AI. and everything, and everyone, everyone's going to use um AI to like pay for stuff. Yeah, I think like our sure. money, our money will disappear, but like we probably won't. So there's an AI activist that used to work for Google who, I don't know, you could take him at a grain of salt, but he swears that Google has a sentient AI already. I saw uh, that. Um, yeah. And Wait. so that, I mean, I, I don't know what the measure of sentience is, but I feel like we'll see that in our lifetime. I don't, I, yeah, I meant specifically like the uploading of consciousness, living forever. You know okay. things like that. I don't think we'll see that now. So. But they're trying. They're definitely trying. Yeah, like, I don't think we'll see a successful early. attempt yeah. in our lifetime. But they're they're already working on it. But I don't think we'll see a successful attempt. What I mean, what we're dealing with is exponential technological development. So, like, in in even a few months, the difference between GPT three and GPT four has been amazing. Mm -hmm. Has been just an incredible leap forward in in processing power and ability and. There are people all over the world feeding more information into these networks, into these okay. models. Excuse me. Developing uh, excuse me. I need to know what GPT four is. Do or don't. Just break it down at English. It's a blowjob. <laughs> oh, GPT four is a, a language model that's like an AI chatbot that's kind of like Google two point that uh, source, it, it scans through basically like all the data that's been fed into it, which is most of like the language humans use on the internet. It can scan through data. It can scan through uh, like videos and songs. And then it, it basically predicts based on what prompt you give it, what it's like the most likely response basically. So it's constructing what it thinks based on its models and pattern sense making ability, what it thinks is, is the, the thing that you're saying. And it's, and then, you know, generally correct. Keep in mind um, what Zach was saying, the difference between GPT-3 and GPT-4. GPT-3 only had a certain amount of knowledge up until like 2020, September or something like that. GPT-4 has access to the entire internet now. So it can give you answers based on the entire internet, whereas the previous model couldn't. I mean, and, and just the, the, the thing of it being exponential is that that's the problem that we're dealing with in almost all these areas is exponential growth doesn't just mean things get bigger. It means they double and then they double. And so, you know, would you rather get a million dollars once or would you rather get one dollar for every, for a day, one dollar a year for a day that doubles every every day? The number at the end of the year of that one dollar turning into two dollars, turning into four dollars, turning into eight dollars, turning into sixteen dollars, doubling forever is going to be fucking astronomical.
And that's what we're dealing with. Exponential extraction. Exponential I would love extraction. to get that kind of money. <laughs> Become you know, a corporation. <laughs> you know, to that point about that, we also, I think I heard someone talking about the printing press. And I think if you compare AI to the printing press, look at what happened with the printing press and its impact on like industrialization, right? And like the exponential growth of just the world economy. And then we're looking at um, AI uh, and chat GPT and all of this. And to Zach's point about exponential growth, like how can we not see that as having even more, you know, growth and progress and then subsequent damage to the environment. And so I agree with uh, Jordan on that 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 like that rate of growth i think is what's going to be so damaging not even necessarily the growth itself but the rate of growth but don't worry i rated the development of this technology is going to develop much more sentient and complex and scary and beautiful possibilities every day way yeah. faster than anyone thinks i can see that and it's going to accelerate every other time span it i mean if we're talking specifically single singularity um, I feel like I just don't, I mean, I don't know. I, f I feel like it's, it's, it's on the fence for me of whether we'll see it or not. Will it, will it happen? Yes. I think there will be a sentient AI. Will we know about it in our lifetime? Will they actually say that? I don't know. I just want to be, I just want to be clear too. I, I hope I'm fucking dead ass wrong. Like <laughs> I really hope that I'm wrong. I mean, I, I think that's going to be the goal no matter what. I mean, because you, if you fin I mean, to me, the, the dopest saying I ever heard in my life, and I don't know where it came from, but it's that um, it's that gods always create their own replacements. And that to me is like my favorite saying in the world. And I feel like we're at the very beginning of doing that as humans. Yeah, we've done. A tremendous job of destroying all kinds of species around the world for hundreds if not thousands of years and wouldn't it be poetic if we were the species that destroyed our own so i think ai is basically a coin toss of whether it's going to absolutely just be the death of us all the accelerator that flips us on the conveyor belt into the inferno or it's going to be the thing that allows the creative aspect of humanity to develop and grow and learn and innovate and evolve fast enough that we're able to outmode this old system. Did Jordan just disappear? For just say, no, he just turned his camera off. He's there though. But like oh, okay. what, what other technology has ever done? That? I feel like we've had some of the most transformative technologies in our lifetime and none of them have done that for humanity. So I just don't have that much. I, I <laughs> wish, I wish that for us, but I just, we haven't used any okay. other technology in that way in my mind. It's the convergence well, like of every technology that. though. That's like how the internet was sold in the 90s. It's like the global village and everyone coming together. We see what a shit show that turned out to be. <laughs> I mean, it, I would call it a net negative on humanity. And yeah, it's not a testament to the technology. It is a testament to, to humanity. But Zach, you're saying, you're saying that because AI is an amalgamation of all the technologies that we have a better, better chance of that? Well, we have a better chance of going extinct, but we also have a better chance of optimizing the creative potential we have people who get outside of this narrow profit maximization addiction to come together and create an organized systematic movement that can support itself, that can actually compete with the old system, that can create a new system that makes the old system just something in our rearview mirror, something obviously inferior, and something that is a feedback loop that spreads so quickly like the printed, like the printing press, like the revolutions that spread because of the ability of ideas to spread and new possibilities. And I don't just mean like ideas. The internet sh can show us videos of how to take apart a car and you know a beheading and uh, you know uh, connect us with nice, lovely new people to have a chat with on a whatever today is afternoon or night. Uh, but it didn't bring about the revolution we thought it would. You know, it brought about the Arab Spring. But I think what is needed is the next stage of that is the ability to show and physically manifest new possibilities not just for people to get on the internet and be able to spread some idea of some post-capitalist or revolutionary or new system but for the the ability for us to actually organize come together realize okay we have to do this not this would be a nice thing and we have the possibility but we actually have to or we're going to fucking die there has to be this 
equal and opposite reaction to the powers that be using all these technologies, which all of them should have caused a revolution in our quality of life. Renewable energy should have been optimized, you know, taken up in the 60s and 70s and developed to phase out fossil fuels to increase our ability to do less labor. Automation in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, there are people writing books called Post-Scarcity Anarchism, talking about automation, creating a society where we don't have to work anymore in the 50s. I mean, we have had this techno technological capacity to destroy the world or completely remake it for so long, but we're in a cultural lag and we're dis dispossessed and disconnected from our agency and our ability to organize and our ability to think straight and actually conceive of and connect with and build these alternatives. And now we have to. We have to. We just don't have a choice. Yeah. So I have kind of a sideways perspective, not different, just sideways, just adjacent. Have any of you seen The Mandalorian season three, the episode with Jack Black, Lizzo? Yes. Okay. So I only needed one nod. That's all I needed. Okay. So in that episode, basically. Um, that sounded like the most AI generated ass episode. Sorry. Sorry. Um, it is. Yeah, it's it's a pretty basic it's a pretty basic episode, but I like I liked it a lot for different reasons. But one of the reasons I liked it was because I felt like it was a visual example in like modern you know sci-fi um, of uh, like the post like labor communist ideal world where basically people are completely reliant upon technology and like in this ideal scenario this um they don't have to work they don't have to do anything except just have a good time and like vibe with each other right which is super awesome there's like no poverty there's no homelessness like there's no hunger like hunger anything like that right and then there's a point where the droids start to malfunction because someone's programming them to malfunction intentionally right and then because of that because people are so reliant on these droids anytime there's a disruption in that system that can disrupt you know our access to food like you guys were mentioning because we're gonna have to ask it eventually if we get to the point where we're relying upon technology we're gonna have to ask it to provide it with our basic needs because we will never be at a point where we are more advanced than technology i don't think humans will get to a point unless we can like successfully build that neural link like you guys are saying to the point where we're half technology half human until we all become these cyborgs where we're our ultimate selves i i think that technology will always have a leg and to answer your question about what leverage workers have if any over ai i don't think they do i don't think we do honestly no, the I fact it was so terrifying to read an ai write an article that i was like i could have i could have written that there's what what did i just go to four years of college for to do if something that somebody else wrote takes 10 seconds to write something that would have taken me two hours like mm -hmm. what am i supposed to do with my life you know <laughs> I think that, that like, ultimately, this is what I really want to say to that, that the idea that we have a, t a society that's completely dependent on technology is very fragile and dangerous and stupid. Um, and that's where we're heading, really. And then most people are connected to this techno nightmare world where people like Bill Gates, even in, like, talking about climate change, are completely allergic to any natural thing, to any connection with nature as a relationship. I mean, I came out here to Colombia to like film and work with and speak with and learn from indigenous peoples. Like, and these are the real fucking AIs. These are the real like chat bots that have the answers that humanity needs. And they've been living without money, without technology, in a completely different sort of social arrangement, without a labor divide, you know, without a working class and an owning class, you know. And, you know, what we need to do is reconnect and plug ourselves back into that source, which is nature, which is life. And we need to create a production, a way of production that is based on nature. That isn't just a, like infinite robots blowing the world up to turn them into things in factories and, you know, hydroponic vertical farms and all these things that are failing anyway that are not really possible, but a, a living food system and a living interrelationship where we are working and living in a relationship based way where we have a relationship with nature. We have a relationship with the corn that grows that we eat. We have a relationship with the soil that nurtures us where the basis of our society isn't, you know, uh, being close to a city center that has lots of jobs that have lots of money that we can make, but being connected to our local ecology, the place that we depend upon to live and actually restructuring our society, a rebellion or a war. I mean, it's a war of, of ideas. It's a war of idea. You know, it's, it, it's a rebellion of creation that we need to be able to reconnect to nature and use it to meet our needs sustainably and spread that 
and bring more and yeah. more people out of this crumbling wage slave system into a stable, beautiful society that meets our needs and allows us to tap into our higher function. That's what's so impressive about these indigenous people is that they meet their needs with nature. Don't they, they have technology like ecological technology, like grow food forests that are mm -hmm. essentially automated, that don't require chemicals, that it's just the forest be growing food and they be eating it. And so like we can do that where we create an, a biological, biotechnical, collaborative society where we meet our needs and AI helps us distribute them. But we are the primary agent. We don't ask it to do. We don't need to ask it for permission to eat. That's the monetary system. That's the system we live in today. That's the current AI. Yeah, but there's a large portion of the world that's never been in touch with nature and has never intended to be in touch with nature. And I feel like until that is addressed, we can't even get on that path. You know what I'm like, there's, a, oh my there's, gosh. A, there's a large swath of the world that has only looked to extract value from nature. You feel what I'm saying? They don't see any other path forward. So I feel like until that is addressed, we can't get on. We can't get on that path. Yeah, go ahead, Aaliyah. Okay, thanks. So I was totally going to bring this up earlier, but it, there wasn't a natural segue. So I'm going to use this as a natural segue. When you were talking about how um, we're considering giving AI rights, I think that it's really, it's a really scary idea to give AI rights before we give like land rights, because like the earth has no protection against humans. And then on top of that, you want to add even, we already have corporations which have rights, which can destroy the planet because the planet doesn't have any rights. And then you want to add even more technology and that technology has rights. That technology is going to continue to destroy the planet, but the planet has no rights yet. So I think that moving forward, our first step should be like environmentalism. I think we should be taking care of our planets first, like through legislative policies, we can make changes to protect our planet now. Then as AI advances, we can fall back on the legislation that we passed today before we became incredibly reliant on AI for everything in society. I think I think the question though then is is there anybody with like the ability to do those things to like lead you know the country or the world into a less connected life right like Zach is talking about or it's already happening yeah like that's um, like right there enough, are but on like a large enough scale where like it's gonna because there are a lot of people that are never going to let go of being like, like Lord was just saying, like they are not, they're, they're connected and they're, they don't even have an interest in, in unconnecting. Um, and then also at the same time, give rights to land. Cause like all the things that we're talking about, like they all have to happen at the same time. You know, we have to be able to give the land rights and develop the technology and get people off the technology and my question for you guys is do we have people that are capable of doing that all at the same time ethically i think I in, in, I in this sorry go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Go, no it's, go ahead <laughs> now i was just saying in the system as it stands now absolutely not you feel what i'm saying like there's this there no one in the system in the current system is incentivized to do that you feel what i'm saying so um i think it comes down to what zach says is creating new systems and developing those new systems but like again like when power is uh <laughs> when power is threatened then those systems get they they fight back harder so that to me is like where the, the problem lies is like have those new systems um, and avoid the wrath or or do we not avoid it and do we just go to war with the system as it stands and and create the new system out of the rubble like how does that work I don't I don't know I don't have the answer for that well one of the questions I that think, I go ahead see I'm sorry I was just gonna say I think if you want like a you know a mass movement you need organization and you know for organization you need some sort of identifying feature sort of class that people can be in and you so it means you need a theory of class and you need class awareness and you need organization i mean it's all like the fundamentals of leftist activism right there but i think spurring class consciousness class awareness in regular ass people who don't know that there is an alternative or can't conceptualize an alternative is really kind of one of the fundamental things most people aren't aware of class structure 
especially in the West, especially in the U.S. I mean, we're told class doesn't exist here. And unless you have like an organizing principle like class, you're not going to be able to organize, especially on a mass scale. It's just unfortunate that we're stuck in this kind of binary. I got to go to Aaliyah after you're done, Zach. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say that uh, I, I feel like that the theory of, of class as the unifier is unfortunately like kind of we're, we're kind of too late for that. We need to jump several stages beyond that to being able to recognize that beyond a class, you are a part of an ecosystem, that we are a part of a larger ecology and we need system consciousness. We need people to understand that they're a part of this system, that the system is the thing that fucks them. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter what your class is, that the system is going to destroy you. I mean, and the majority of the people on earth, uh, to answer something you said a minute ago, Lord, you said there, most people are not connected to nature and they just want to make money. I think you're just, you're, you're defining or describing like the capitalist class in the West. Well, the, the West has a, a very small percentage of the world's population, a very small percentage of the world's population and land area is devoted to urban environments and cities and places where people are cut off from nature. The majority of the world lives connected to nature still. You know, in some capacity, in a place like this, a third world country like Colombia, you know, I'm immersed in it. Every it's everywhere. You know, they they they've been warring against the nature here for, you know, what 400 years or something, mm -hmm. and it's still quite thriving. There are cities and places that it's been demolished, but I think the majority of the world, and this is a global struggle, uh, has everything to gain from understanding. You know, going past, going beyond just class consciousness, which is super important. It's, it's important for people who are within class structures in the top to understand that. And it's, it's important for people to understand that, that, that the bad things that are happening to them don't have to be this way. That things can be better. But I, just keep, I keep thinking about this Carl Jung quote, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on in a minute. That it's like you don't solve problems by focusing on the problem itself. You solve problems by raising consciousness to the point where the solution becomes something self-evident and apparent, and you sort of glide into it. That AI is a big part of that. It's a big part of accelerating our consciousness way past the issue of class, way past the issue of, of ecology or economy or labor disputes or technology or any of these individual issues, which we'll never solve if we focus on them. It's to raise our collective consciousness to such a degree where we are actually participating in creating this new thing that is becoming itself and developing itself, this collective process that's emerging and evolving all over the world and being shaped and sort of sort of made sense by our in information technologies like AI, that we, 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 we can't beat the system in the systems game. We can't revolt. We can't have a class-based struggle where people seize the means of production and go take over the Amazon warehouse and you know, start using it for the production of the proletariat. Like we, It's too late for that. We're beyond that stage of our social revolutionary uh, necessity, and we need to go beyond it to a completely different set, set of solutions to a completely different set of problems because the big problems when we zoom out are ecological that we are poisoning the air the water the soil of our planet and it is accelerating and species are dying i mean we've, we've lost 70 percent of the life on this planet in the last 50 years and that's a process that's exp exponentially accelerating and it's a process that's very fragile that is being destroyed and that could collapse at any time the honeybees go extinct all life on Earth is going to follow very, very quickly, quicker than we have a self-possessed, self intelligent AI. Yeah, go ahead, Olivia. That was a rant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can barely remember um, what I was going to talk about earlier, but I think... Zach, you long-winded ass. Yeah. Um... It's all connected. <laughs> yeah, it is all connected, though, and I totally, I totally agree with that. I also think that education is going to be like the biggest call i think like you're saying i think if people were educated they would be more passionate about it yeah. because how like there's a reason why when you know people on the right go to college and they come out being like having more of a leftist perspective it's because education when you learn about the reality of things no it's because indoctrination <laughs> duh <laughs> indoctrination into caring about other cultural people. marxism so <laughs> and so I think that I think that if we start to you know teach like social emotional learning at, at a really young age, I think that that can really like um, among everything else, I think that that can really bring people up into this like ideal society where we can just glide into change, and that that's not something that's going to be a challenge for us. But I think in the meantime, we have 
we have to like how do you expect us to just educate the entire mass? Because you're saying it's difficult to organize. It's easier to just have people be educated because then organizing comes after that. But how can you educate people if you don't organize to educate people? Well, the first right? step to answer yeah. that would be you have to have a society that prioritizes education in the first place. And we don't have that. Mm. Exactly. So what do you do in the meantime to protect the environment? If you can't encourage people now and teach people now about like environmental issues, you know, no matter how many Bill Nye, the science guy videos he makes about climate change, we're not going to be able to change the entire country's mind, even because even if we do do that with education, that's still younger generations. So we still need yeah. to make change now that yeah. impacts current generations. And I think that we're seeing current impacts of climate change. So current things that we can do now without having to look towards the future long term, more so than just what can we do right now to make the, the world a better place is to get land rights, because that is something we already have a ton of environmentalist organizations, right? We have like California youth versus big oil, who's, you know, actively working with Governor Newsom against major oil corporations in California. And so, yeah, land back, bitch, exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I think that, that is going to be, I just think that's going to be a really big part of it because if environmental organizations all united under the idea that, well, we wouldn't have to beg Governor Newsom with a ton of little school, public board school resolutions that we should not be drilling oil in, you know, oil wells hundreds of feet next to schools which is happening in oxnard right now in lemonwood and so like if we if we don't want to see that then environmentalist organizations need to unite and under the idea that we need to be doing land back efforts as primary and as well as land rights because if we grant land rights then when major oil corporations try and you know dig oil then that's when we can go to the courts and start you know battling shit out yeah, I could um, just go on a big long rant, but I have an answer to that. Uh, when you guys, when you guys, no, you, you can go, you can go for it. You can go for it. No, no, you go, go ahead, Lord. Um, I was just saying, I don't think we do educate um, huge swaths of the population. I think that, um, I think that conversations like this hopefully lead to people getting connected and and organizing, and then um, new new organizations as far as like new maybe, maybe even new cities new new towns come out of like these because I, I i do think that we are entering in a in an era where something that a lot of people don't think about is like there are digital um cities that are coming out like where, where they only exist you know where large populations exist digitally and will be recognized and have their own sovereignty and um i think that as that happens more um, that that will be a low key opportunity for um, organizations to network and create, you know, bigger, um, bigger movements. But I mean, for me, like I'm just at the point I'm, I'm a little bit of a pessimist, but I'm just kind of at the point where like I am trying to educate the people that are closest to me and the people that I care about the most and like that's all I can really do right now and encourage them to do the same. And hopefully that, that extends to, you know, a, a bigger uh, audience, but um, that's just kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah. You know, something that I really think about too, is like, if you go overseas, a lot of their airports are named after like poets and authors and, you know, intellectual heroes. And then ours are, what are they? Presidents. John Wayne. <laughs> yeah. John Wayne, Hollywood actors. I, I think that really says a lot about our society. <laughs> Aaliyah, I want to answer your, your big question there, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the things you were saying. You were saying land back, bitch, which I agree with. I think that's an essential component is getting land and uh, occupying it and changing our mode of production back into the land providing for us and restoring it, working with it. That's what we're doing out here. You know, That's what all the people that I know about, that's, that's their goal is to acquire land and either get it to the indigenous people or work with the indigenous people to develop regenerative systems and reserves and to preserve 8% and to have 20% of it be. And um, I think that the movement that is going to change things is and, that, and is going to educate people, you need a physical thing because we've been talking about this for so long. We've been talking about these issues, these systems, these alternatives, these other modalities of thinking for hundreds of years. And the problems have existed and things haven't really changed because 
today I'm a podcaster, I'm a talker, I'm an activist. I've been trying to unite the climate groups to, towards system change, toward not any one individual goal, but towards systems change. And they're very focused on their individual little thing. I were just about oil. I fucking fought tooth and nail against and with Extinction Rebellion Los Angeles to try to get them to understand like we need systemic goals. Like this whole like just stop oil thing is bullshit. It's not working. It doesn't connect with the average person. We need to connect this to the working class struggle. We need to connect this to the struggle of the feminism. We need to connect this to all these other struggles because it's one struggle. It's a system struggle. And so how we educate people about that, you can't just talk about it. There's a small group of people listening to shows like this, talking about these things online, and a large group of people who care about them broadly. So you change things and you get people educated and active by actually creating living models, living movements, living applications that people can use to share goods and services, that, that people can use to communicate and connect with each other. Real communities, real cooperatives in your area that provide an alternative to wage slavery. Places where land is appropriated, taken back, or purchased collectively, however we get it, we just fucking get it. Maybe somebody's grandma owned it and they donated to the cause. We get people living on land. You want people to care about land? Connect them to it. Make it their home. Then they will care about it. Then they will do things to make sure that the water there is drinkable. True. And I think we need to create this feedback loop where we're acquiring more land and more resources and building a greater network, not my community and your community and your project and my project and your co-op and my co-op, but an interconnected network where our, our fate is the same where we are actively working with each other to enrich each other. And we're using things like AI to streamline the flow of resources so that all communities get what they need. The people that are needed in certain communities may maybe have a certain skill, go where they're needed, the information that certain communities need, that people need, that individuals need, that say someone has a project that they're working on, but they don't have the resources, but someone else does. They don't, they shouldn't have to ask the system and, you know, or bust their ass to make money to be able to get the resource to do this. We should have algorithms and you know, intelligent machines that help find the people and connect them with each other. That's what AI should be in our society, is a connector and a sense maker and a streamliner of calculations and economy. It should be doing the economy for us while we do the physical stuff, where we you know, maintain relationships with the earth, we design things. I could go on and on and on about this. This is what Moneyless Society, this is what my show is, this is what our organization is. And we're trying to put out the beacon to say, we have to do this. We have to do it, that they aren't going to. There's not going to be a political movement. There's, I mean, unless we build power and feed people and create means and spread it, there's not going to be a change that comes through any mechanism within the system. We have to create a new system and oppose the other one and be a bright, shining alternative that shows people, come over here, check it out. Look at this. It works. We don't do the things you don't. We don't sit in traffic. We're not hungry. We don't have homeless people. We share. And we spend our time listening to music and making art and having fun and creating a world that we want to live in and advancing that commuting and traffic is actually crazy yeah like if you think about it like on the road at nine o'clock in the morning and it's just bumper to bumper traffic because everybody's trying to get to work like what the fuck we don't need to live in a world like you, that you're you're manually operating a machine to drive like five miles what the fuck oh yeah and you don't get paid for that by the way <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's how it was today. Traffic was horrible. You don't get paid for your commute. I've a, that's always fucking bothered me. I don't know. What else do you guys want to add? Oh yeah, wait, wait. I had actually had one thing that I've been wanting to say forever. So one of the one of the things that I meant by like, is there going to be a mass rebellion against social media and AI? Is I kind of have like the sense that society as a whole is going to get kind of fed up with the rapid development of technology. And I think that people are going to get angry about it to the point where they get into the streets and we have some sort of like re revolution in the sense where people long towards meaningful in-person lasting relationships. They go back to things like writing books and reading. Yeah. And or actually writing on paper. I, your phone. I see a lot of people kind of just like waking up to this tech dystopia. What do you guys think about that? I don't think that it would ever be an organized effort because organizing today, like in our current political climate, like cons it like consists almost entirely 
of using technology in their internet. Agreed. I think it would be random and organic. I think it would be kind of like George Floyd. Oh, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Then I think that that is, I think that it's a possibility in the sense that I think humans have the the possibility to rise up against anything. You know, if we wanted to rise up against condoms, we could, right? Rise up against bras, free to knit, we should, right? And so I felt like, I think that like there are a lot of reasons for people to rise up and I don't think social media is going to be one of them. I think what we're going to see is I think we're going to see individual acts and bursts of violence like the tons of young white school shooters that we're seeing today. Dun, dun, dun. When have people ever rallied together to rise for something? It's always, we're against this, we're against this, we're against this. You know, when have we ever come together consciously or spontaneously and said, we are for this. This is what we want. This is what we are creating. And I, and I just think I'm, I'm tired of the protest. I'm tired of the energy of people getting out and yelling. It doesn't that accomplish part, anything. That part. I feel like it doesn't um, accomplish anything. Yeah. If, if it was going to happen, if anyone's going to do it, I think Jen Pop will do it. I just read this article about how a lot of them um, are abandoning you know smartphones and the internet and meeting up in person and writing on notes and and things like that and i so i don't know if it'll be like an an angry militant kind of this is kind of what i mean just like yeah like maybe not an angry militant movement but like a, a strategic shift in consciousness and i think i think honestly something we don't even think about is just like you know um cool coolness is always a thing with younger people and like if all the old people are with their heads buried in their phones at a certain point it's not going to be looked at as cool <laughs> to the young people hopefully there's enough of those young people that you know start to create a movement but i definitely think that's what's happening i i, I don't even think like gin pop is necessarily like consciously saying we don't want these things i just think they're like i don't want to be like my mom and my dad and my mom and my dad is on tiktok doing dances and shit and i don't want to do that you know <laughs> i think, you're, I, think so, you're, I think you're totally fucking right um I, I just said in the chat every generation pretty much rebels against the previous one so that tracks with what you're saying yeah that's true and uh i'm not sure yeah. if that's if if that's entirely true, because I think that Gen X, Millennials, and Gen Z, and I think the solidarity between those three generations is a really great example of how when parents are actively going through efforts to like break cycles of violence for their children and raise their children in like homes that are much kinder and much nicer and et cetera, then I think we're, we're seeing like a reduction in like domestic violence overall, right? And so I think that that is because of gen, like gen x and millennials being better at raising their children than boomers were to them you know and so i think that each generation actually is getting a little bit better and i i the most that gen z has like argued against millennials has been making fun of them being on tiktok and stuff like that but i, I could not as a gen z i could not tell you of anybody i know in my life that was like oh, freaking millennials like no like we definitely have no like we're not like just sitting around a room no crap about yeah we don't fucking millennials. care <laughs> no we so don't. i i definitely don't think that the every generation rebels against previous ones i think that our generations are working together and i think we've been doing it successfully and i i think we're seeing that happen today that's fair yeah and i think everything is going to circle back back around too like what's popping today may not be popping like 10 years from now, but maybe 30 or 40 years from now, it'll come back and it'll be popping again. Constant, that would yeah. Yeah. Cause like a lot of old styles, like even with clothing and stuff came back like from back then, you know what I mean? Yeah. And mm -hmm. then now that shit's cool now. I will say as a, a dance teacher to kids and a father of three, um, I'm, I'm kind of looked at as like the cool guy and so my kids, like, if I'm like, dude, let's go outside, they will throw their device in the corner and jump outside. So <laughs> I do definitely agree with you. It is uh, something to do with our generations being able to work well together and stuff because we are teaching better and stuff. Uh, so but I, in that same token, that also means that what you're talking about actually will kind of happen, right? There will be another shift because every generation does have their version of a shift, whatever it may be. It's just its focus becomes something different. And that's like a, I don't know, collective. I have another question. So Aaliyah, you're arguing that the generations are actually uniting as time goes on. Do you think that that has anything to do with the deterioration of material conditions? 
Because what I mean by that is Generation X was the first generation that made less money than their parents did. And that was one of the reasons that the grunge movement came to be. Go ahead, C. No, no, I was just I was just raising my hand as a member of Gen X who <laughs> made a lot less money than my parents. <laughs> but I, I was just identifying, self-identifying. Go ahead. Um, I de okay, so I definitely think the deteriorating wages and the val like the value of our currency decreasing. I definitely think that contributed to it. Um, but I think it more so had to do with like each generation making the conscious decision to raise their children differently. And I don't think that's because like we were necessarily no longer wishing to acquire wealth anymore because, you know, we didn't need it. We're less materialistic. I don't think that's why. I think that it was because we, I, I don't want to say we're more materialistic, but like fast fashion, like, I don't know. I feel like, that's I feel like we're still a very well. materialistic generation gen z and millennials i think gen x is like probably really the only one that's less materialistic than we are and so i, I don't know I, I don't think i would say materialism has anything to do with it i think that it has to do with like us no no no, not not material not materialism uh, material conditions oh, oh material bro I'm saying that 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 the okay. level yeah like that that the last generations and and all generations really backward we're accumulating and making more money and, and just generally being raised up by the system of imperialism around them that deprives the rest of the world of stuff so that they can have it. Whereas our generation is one of the first or Gen X, as you were saying, is the first where things are worse. And, you know, it's, it's really funny thinking about like the I just wanted healthcare crowd. Most of them, if yeah. they got healthcare, would shut the fuck up. They wouldn't complain. They wouldn't care about the cobalt mining and and the fucking you know fact that there is more slaves on the planet Earth than ever before. Back to brunch, the Democrats. They'd be like, fine. And most people would probably be like, yeah, that's, that's okay. And I, I just want to say that we we weren't raised by our parents. We were raised by our culture, you know. And there's an effect that parents have on their children's lives. Oh, but I think a lot of Gen Xers or sorry, Gen Zers are raised by TikTok. They're raised by this weird collective intelligence and by these algorithms and by these material conditions that generate the culture. The material conditions create the culture that is then fed down to the children who reinforce it and think it's normal and then they spread it and so we are the one of the first cultures that is experiencing a, a shift in there both in terms of the material structure of the technology that we have in, uh, in our lives that we have access to not just access to but that is imposed upon us that we are born into but also those material conditions and the changing you know uh, Relate the declining productivity. Oh, sorry, the, the the declining wages despite uh, you know increasing productivity and all that, and the, you know the the news that is coming to us through our cell phones, a material relationship that's telling us that this world is going to end, and the feeling of being exploited, the feeling that it fucking sucks to be alive, and that we can't buy a house, and that we can't do anything, and that our jobs are bullshit, and that all these problems that are just really obvious for most of the people that we know. So we have very different attitudes because of that, not because someone consciously raised us differently. Yeah, go ahead, Aaliyah. You wanted to respond? Yeah, I, I don't I don't disagree that I think that that contributed to it, but I do think that there was an active effort made. Like, like I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying you're right. And also, I think there was an active effort made by parents to raise their children in a better world. And like, a, I, I just, I think we do, period. Because like, like I said, domestic violence is de decreasing. Like in house in households of lower income, domestic violence is higher. So if we're like losing income overall, we're coming at the bottom of this bell curve of where we're the first generation that's not making more money than our parents before. We're not living as well off as our parents before. Like I, I just don't see how that is like a significant enough contributor compared to the efforts that parents actively made. Like, I understand how, like, that contributed to why the parents made the effort that they did. But I think at the end of the day, the parents still made that effort. They could, because they could have not, they could have just not made that effort and we could just keep living in a shitty society. But I think our, I think Generation X and Millennial Generation adapted to that and made it so that we would live in better lives. Oh, yeah. I think you actually said, go ahead. No, bad. No, bad. You, you said something very profound there that has a much deeper reverberation that lower income houses or areas 
have higher crime and higher rates of domestic abuse. And it's inequality specifically, the difference between rich and poor that creates this disruption that across the board, when, when seriously studied, like we had James Gilligan, a great expert in violence, and I'm going to have to change the battery in my mic, but I'm going to finish this rant. Uh, James Gilligan, this expert in violence, hang on one second. Uh, the, the greatest expert in violence out there has said that inequality is the scourge of violence, is the cause of violence, and that the material conditions and the economic conditions that we're born into are really dictating that. And so like our, our parents, my parents specifically, had to work more than the generation before them. So they didn't have as much time to raise us. So it, the choices that they're able to make are limited by those structural factors. And I just think this is a really important way of looking at things and almost in a way kind of depersonalizing ourselves from conscious choice and the role that that makes in determining what our society is as this large, complex ecosystem organism that we, we aren't consciously make, pushing the world in the direction that it's going. Even the CEOs and the people in the boardrooms and the people designing the technology are not consciously shaping the culture that comes out of it. Zuckerberg isn't consciously creating the effects that Facebook had where, you know, Every young girl who stares into the dark crystal of this app feels worse about themselves, where suicide is going up, where people have used this application, this fun little app to talk to your friends, to topple third world governments, et cetera, and spread misinformation. But the effects that, we're, that, are, that the structure is having on this society around us is not intentional. And you take people with good intentions and you put them into that bad structure and they get washed into its values. So... We're, we're trying to become conscious, become real intelligent, not artificial intelligent, running on this societal program that is determined and programmed by our material conditions, by the uh, artificial race for resources and competition over, over false scarcity that is our economic system. Well said. Laura, do you want to respond? Yeah, I just wanted to clear up that um, I, when I say that, you know, I think Gen Pop is the most likely to go back to the analog way of, way of life. Um, I don't, and I think that they're doing that to not be like their parents. I don't think that that necessarily has to be contentious. I don't think that they're looking at their parents as like, oh my God, like, you know, I don't, you know, I, I just mean that like, you know, as a kid, you want to do your own thing. You want to find your own way. But then I also think that, um, the fact that they see more, like, I mean, when I was growing up, you know, I saw myself, I saw, like, I literally saw what I looked like two times a day before I left school and when I came home and before I went to bed, that's, those are the two times I looked in the mirror, you know what I'm saying? So like, I feel like I didn't have access to, I read a lot of magazines and that's kind of how I learned about other p walks of lives, but I couldn't just pull a device out of my pocket and like know about what somebody in, on the other side of the world was doing. And so I think that that has given, I, I don't want to take any credit away from parents, but I would, I would honestly give more credit to devices and access um, for giving um, gener uh, Gen Z, Gen Pop, and you know the younger Gen X and the younger millennials a higher EQ, and I think that higher EQ has um, caused us and allowed us to work together uh, a lot better. You know what I'm saying? Like because I know the generation above me, um, I'm a millennial, yeah. So the generation X above me, like. Um, there was there was a lot of contention there was a lot of like traditionalism and like oh you don't do it like this you like to wear your clothes like this y'all fuck y'all you know what i'm saying there at least in the bubble that i lived in there was a lot of that you know what i'm saying so but i think that as we got more access to looking at different walks of life um at least for me that gave me a higher eq and that allowed me to say oh maybe maybe the way i thinking it may maybe the way i think about things isn't the only way to think about things you know what i'm saying and i think as the generations go on they get better at doing that and that causes us to work better together well so totally with that yeah what did you want to say heather yeah i think that um i think that you know the 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 point about millennial parents trying millennial and gen x parents uh is is spot on Aliyah. but i i also think that we need to look at like what is going on in the country right now and like how hard it is for 
millennial parents to now provide for their kids. So they're having to like cut back on things. And then they're also sending their kids to school. And I see a lot of posts, like I have two Gen Z and I have, what is it, Gen Pop? He's six, so whatever. Um, and I homeschool my kids. Um, and I'm very fortunate that I've been able to do that. But I know so many people who, um, who are, you know, who are like posting and saying like, what are our kids gonna think of us when we're sending our, we're sending them to, to be shot, right? And um, my older daughters have a lot of friends who feel resentful towards their parents, right? Because they had to do shooter drills or whatever. And I think that I, I tend to think that even though like we're a more nurturing, like you said, um, group of parents, I, I think that ultimately there is going to be a rebellion and maybe it'll something big will have to happen right like we see a lot of kids quit yeah um we see a lot of kids get off uh social media uh uh because of all their lonely the you know this loneliness uh mental health crisis that they're experiencing and so it's more like a reaction right um and sorry I'm getting a text. So um, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, I think it's both. I think it's both things ultimately. Uh, you know, yeah, I totally lost my train of thought. But sorry, I was getting a text. But I think it'll be something like drastic that has to happen to get the kids to stop using their phone. Because like my kids use their phone all the time. Um, but then they have friends that like have gone through a school shooting. Remember the school shooting in Santa Clarita? Uh, those girls don't use social media anymore because they just like, they can't even pro like they can't deal with it. Right. Like they had to go out and touch grass and, and like not be inundated with the bad news all the time. Um, so I think it's more a reactionary thing. Ultimately. So, so earlier, um, Aaliyah had mentioned, you know, social emotional, uh, teaching social emotional skills and stuff is kind of like the solution to that whole thing, which is what you just shared, Heather. And um, I 100% agree, like my kids, I've been teaching them so much about social emotional stuff that um, their teachers will come to me and uh, will say, hey, your kids are very mature socially. You know, they're very helpful. They're very kind. They're they're like leaders already. And it's because I speak to them as an adult, but not like, oh, like you got to go pay bills. No, but, you know, as real people, you know, and um, oh, my gosh, my point. My, oh, and so even to the point where sometimes I will be like, OK, you know what? No more devices for like a week or whatever else and they'll be cool with it they'll be happy about it and you know move on to whatever else they want to do and i've teach them about technology being a tool not something to be dependent upon but something to help you navigate through this world that is increasingly you know driven to be towards technology um so obviously i'm just one parent you know so i know it's not like a whole i'm changing the world thing but what I've come to learn is in me teaching them stuff, their friends end up learning stuff too, because it goes back to the whole social emotional thing. Um, and then they learn there's a better, just like how I did. I learned there was a better situation, a better way of living. I went and searched for it because I learned through someone else's perspective, someone else's eyes in middle school. You know what I mean? So that's and the, the solution isn't going to happen today. That's for sure. But it's on its way. No pun intended. <laughs> Zach, you can't. We can't hear you. Jack, uh, yeah. better, better. Yeah, uh, I can hear you. you. Okay, yeah, I was going to say that the system, that the solution to that is ironically new utilization of technology to you know tap into these sort of addictive centers of these kids' brains to put them into a new feedback loop, and I think that the basically the programming of that that social media technology that's warping them is doing what it's told <laughs> the machine the algorithm is doing what it's told and i think we have to create some kind of uh, grassroots uh open source you know alternative benevolent app that's controlled and intentionally designed to uh, facilitate in the touching grass process that is programmed to get children out of this virtual world 
and into the real world and, and, and to help develop their actual skills and curiosities. And I think, you know, GPT is an amazing thing. I mean, kids could just sit in a room and talk the fucking holy or uh, talk to the Oracle about the truths of the universe and get answers and, and be facilitated in that. And I think utilizing to sort of loop things back into our theme of AI, you know, how can we use this technology to help children's self-esteem, to help children's, you know, investment in reality, to help develop new ideas and innovations and help people find their purpose. I think in a big way, it's helping people find their people. It's helping people like us find each other. And that's not that complicated a process that you don't need artificial intelligence or general AI to be able to do that. You just need algorithms. You just need basically, you know, to make calculations based on the language people are using and connect them. Say somebody uses some, you know, the word class consciousness and they're in your area. You know, it's, it's really funny. It's like you run into these people on these apps and they have different politics than you by like one percent off and you're like oh fuck these people <laughs> and then you you like, you like see somebody in like in, in your school like at the grocery store and they have like a shirt with lenin or stalin on it and you're like fuck yeah that's my guy that's my guy right there <laughs> even though you know like of course there's things you disagree with but it's like you know i just think creating an application whose purpose is to bring people together with other people like them who think like them who are in their area that they can come crowd into a little screen like like uh, Jordan's here with their buddies and laugh and crack up and you know plot to overthrow the the system and rule the world, you know uh, that there's great possibility for that. There's great possibility for it to get even better at harvesting and mining our attention and you know really really understanding psychology to sell advertisements and uh, you know curate videos to your feed to make it even more addictive. And just just worm into every single free second you have, and become more and more integrated into society, so that you have to spend your time developing this social media avatar, this version of yourself that you're selling all the time, like a fucking product. Woo! We're in a fucking weird time, boys and girls, and people in between. Oh, did you all bring up about the NFTs? How, real, real quick, how long how long is this going to last? How long are we going to be in this little box? Honestly, we can wrap up right now, unless you guys have anything else you want to say. I would like to talk about like solutions. Um, yeah, I would like to talk about solutions, but uh, I would like you know not to just keep ranting because I'm doing that. <laughs> Does anybody else want to talk? I'm um, enjoying yeah, the go rant. for it. <laughs> I uh, I love what you said about people branding. It's crazy. Like um, I remember distinctly when like only people involved in industry would would say branding and like it's so weird to hear people saying like my brand like just a random person my brand is this and i'm like you don't even sell anything like what do you mean your brand is this is fucking crazy that's crazy like everybody knows about branding now it's super super weird but um i, I feel like for me um i gotta bounce super soon but i, I definitely want to um a uh connect with everybody so if i don't know if you can drop your socials in the and speaking of technology if you could drop your socials in the chat um i, I follow i tried to find those of you that i could find on my own but i couldn't find everybody so please drop your socials in the chat um, i would love to follow you and then i um i personally want to use i think um the next big wave is um, Hollywood and, and all industries are going to attack small towns and extract resources from those small towns. Um, and, and I really think that um, we need to have control over those those our own cities and our own regions uh, before that starts to happen. Um, so that's what I'm really focused on. Thank you so much for dropping those in there. Um, so I have a WhatsApp that um, I'm using to educate people um, on new technology, emerging technology and how they can apply it to, to maybe achieve their dreams. And I'm hoping that, you know, if you, if we help somebody, you know, make, make it easier for them to accomplish the things they want to do, then they'll see other use cases for the technology. And so that's what I feel like my goal and my passion is. So if anybody's interested, Interested in joining that WhatsApp? If you have opportunities that you can provide to artists or sure. education opportunities or, or actual opportunity or any other kind of opportunities, um, I would love to hear from you and just connect with you. And um, yeah, I'm I'm here to here to help as well. So that's that's what I have to offer and say. Hey, thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate it. I, I can't wait to have you on for our future panel. It's been fun chopping it up. I'm definitely down. I appreciate all you guys, and I will give you. I'm copying and pasting, and I will give everybody a follow that I'm not already following. I hope everybody has a good night and a good week. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you leave, before you leave, oh, yeah, I'm yeah, coming yeah. to ask everybody um, for a favor. So I know that we taught you were talking at the end about how you wanted.
solutions, right? Um, and how you wanted, I think we all kind of mentioned it a little bit in the chat about how we want to see more intersectionality within organizations. Because a lot of times they get really like one track minded and then they kind of don't deviate. And then a lot of times everybody suffers as a result. Um, I am actively organizing against that in Ventura County. I'm having an event um, this summer. It's called the Youth Civic Engagement Fair. It's basically like a job fair or something like that, where basically we have booths of all the different youth social justice organizations in the county that are all gonna be in one space at one time. That way activists, because our, in our county, not everybody's from Ventura County, but in Ventura County, it's an hour from one side to the other. And so having an event in the middle where people from all sides of the county can come is kind of perfect. And and so the idea is that people from, you know, West County get to hang out with activists from East County and environmental organizations who might not know of each other are able to work together, learn more about stuff like that. And then we're also going to be having a series of workshops to make sure that we're really emphasizing intersectionalism inside each organization. And then, of course, and now I'm especially bringing this up because there's so many musical artists in the crowd um we have live music as well so we're going to have a lot of performers um but we want to highlight performers who are interested in issues like this so any oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. who's Dinosaur. interested please hit me up on social media and i will straight just add you to our list of performers right now for our event in the summer i'm also so, a show host you're also a show host well yeah, if you want to do it, do it for free stage. If you want to do it for free, you're more than welcome. To I'm down for a mission. Yes. Hey, when was the date on that? <laughs> Let's go. The, <laughs> the um, it's in August, so it's August fifth. Uh, so it's the first Saturday, basically, of August. Okay. So hopefully, Let's the go. idea yeah. is that a lot of the college students will okay. be back for the summer. So that's that's yeah, all. Be me, for the J -L -G -T -Y official. I will be hitting you up. Okay, great. I'll I'll be here. My name is literally social media. There's just an an underscore in my. So, Aaliyah, I'll bring you on to, uh, we have a radio show I do every night called Connect yeah. Coast Radio. If you want to come on and talk about that, um, you're more than welcome to as well. And anybody Aaliyah. else that wants to come on and talk about anything, you're welcome as well. Aaliyah also hosts a podcast, by the way. Yes. Uh, I've done nothing with it, though. I've done nothing <laughs> with it. It's Right now, I just have a series of interviews with all these people that are recorded and not edited. And they're just sitting in my broken computer at home, so I literally can't do anything until there's, I fly back. Program, spe speaking of AI, there's a there's a program called <laughs> Autopod that will automatically edit podcasts really? for you. Really? Yeah. Factual. I don't know, guys, I might completely change my mind on AI tonight. If there's, <laughs> yeah, there's actually there's another one called Wave Tool that's free. It's a it's like Pro Tools built into a browser, and so you can record anything you want to directly into the browser. It's called WAVTool.com, and it's all AI powered. So those are the two oh, things you yeah. need, and you can get your shit busting. Well, oh. I just wrote it down. Thank you so much. <laughs> Check. Yeah, I also just wanted to say um, that none of this is real, by the way. <laughs> All of us are. <laughs> I love you. I got to get out of here, y'all. I appreciate you, but I'll be in touch. It's nice to meet everyone. Yeah, you yeah. too. Take Good care. Night. Peace, Good night, peace. Bro. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thanks for being here, Marlo. Bye. Peace. Peace. Bro, you're dope, Marlo. You're dope. Wait, did somebody did somebody screen record the chat before? <laughs> I have it. I have it. Okay, you do? Okay. <laughs> She's awesome. like, hold on. She just throws in a group.